Chapter 1. Something is unsettled in the court just don't bother me painfully and for a long time they elected the Supreme Soviet of the 13th Convocation, painfully and for a long time, the head of state did everything to prevent the deputies from being elected, either Lukashenko opposed all candidates in general, then against those who had already been elected to parliament before, but even his almost frank calls to sabotage the elections did not help, and when four rounds of voting had passed, the president nevertheless received the Supreme Council, which became a source of constant irritation for him, a total of 199 deputies were elected, you could start working, it was not the highest body of legislative power, but a real Noah's Ark, where seven pairs of clean and seven pairs of unclean fell, employees of the executive authorities who are loyal to the president and who are extremely negative towards him also got there, Viktor Goncha, Stanislav Shashkovich, Machislav Hrib, Stanislav Bogdankovich, deputy of the Supreme Council Vladimir Nistakas assesses its composition as follows, the Supreme Council of the 13th Convocation was an amazing parliament for Lukashenko, both in terms of composition and in terms of the leadership that was elected, 50 communists, 50 agrarians, 60, the consent faction, already 160, and only 30 40 people who were oppositionists, and the democratic press even compared the Supreme Soviet of the 13th Convocation with the watermelon, green on the outside, agrarian, inside red, communist, despite this, Lukashenko did not hide his annoyance that the elections did take place, commenting on their results, he angrily declared that the Supreme Soviet of the 13th Convocation is inherently not red, communist, but blue, criminal, there were no specific facts behind these words, just from the very beginning the president tried to discredit the highest body of legislative power, nevertheless, he immediately tried to buy the deputies, that is, to appease them and thereby secure himself, as Sergei Kalyakin recalls, even before the opening of the first session, the representatives of the factions met with the president, we expected that we would talk about some kind of effective interaction, about cooperation, but the president led the conversation in a different way, I am ready to give you everything you want, let the deputies have the salary of ministers, the members of the presidium will have the salary of the vice premier will buy you all a Volvo car, you'll get it from the administration, we'll equip jobs for you, we'll do everything for you, just don't interfere with my work, I'll call you twice a year, at the beginning of the year and at the end, just don't interfere with my work but buying the deputies failed, it was not very easy to intimidate them, try, intimidate the same communist, after he had been defamed so much by the entire press, Kalyakin continues, Lukashenko immediately realized that they would not be able to buy us, this was the beginning of his skirmishes with the factions, after all, the same conversation was held with the agrarians, and in principle with the same result, neither they nor any other faction agreed to go into obedience, but this was only the beginning of the difficulties in the work of the 13th Supreme Council, Sharitsky does not want confrontation the first intrigue unfolded around the election of the speaker, Lukashenko was offended by the refusal of the leaders of the factions to not interfere with him and did not push anyone, he was not at all going to play parliamentarism and, it seems, even then he knew how this parliament would end up. The post of chairman of the Supreme Council was, according to the constitution, the second post in the state, and it was clear that all factions would nominate their candidates. Of course, the largest factions had the greatest chances, the agrarian, communist and pro-presidential ones, it was up to the small thing, 
to consolidate the votes, remembers Valentina Sviatskaya 209 then an informal advisor to the leader of the agrarian faction, Samyan Sharitsky, we must pay tribute to the communists, they realize that their candidate for the post of chairman simply will not pass, but the communists had to keep a face and put forward their candidacy, and they did it, they nominated Sergei Kalyakin, Sergei Kalyakin could probably be a good speaker, relatively young, energetic, he possessed oratory skills and went through a good school of practical work as chairman of one of the Minsk district executive committees, perhaps he could organize the work of the Supreme Council and turn it into a real center of the country's political life, but the communist faction was forced to compromise with the agrarians, we agreed, whose candidate gains a majority in the first round of voting, both factions will give their votes, and the losing faction receives the post of first vice speaker. After the candidates delivered keynote speeches, Sergei Kalyakin was only second, exactly one vote more, 61 against 60, was won by the leader of the Agrarian Party, Samyan Sharitsky, and Kalyakin urged his supporters to vote for Sharitsky 210. At the time of his election to the post of chairman of the Supreme Council of the 13th Convocation, Samyan Sharitsky was 59 years old, it was enough for Lukashenko to hear the name of the person chosen as the second person of the state, and he could sleep peacefully, the Sharitskys do not know how to rebel, cunning, dodging, gaining in your favor, this is another matter. But this is not politics, this is only peasant calculation, without which you cannot live in our village, in favor of such a person, no one would ever arrange hardware conspiracies, yes, and Sharitsky himself was hardly capable of conspiracies, he reveled in his own takeoff and did not want more, it became clear that Lukashenko got a respite in the fight against the parliament, and that means hope of winning, Sharitsky was in no way going to enter into a confrontation with Lukashenko said Valentina Sviatskaya, who at that time was also the secretary of the executive committee of the agrarian party, who, if not her, should know what exactly Samyan Sharitsky expected from the president, the first actions of the new speaker confirmed that he diligently avoids conflicts with the head of state, for example, Samyan Sharitsky did not put on the agenda of the session the issue of illegal dismissal by presidential decree of the editor of the parliamentary Narodna Gazeta Iosif Saradik. This issue was very painful for the deputies. The president began to control their newspaper, considering that the live broadcasts of the sessions were also stopped. It becomes obvious that the Supreme Council was deprived of the opportunity to address the electorate, and there was already a need for such an appeal. It turns out the Constitution is violated in February 1996. The Constitutional Court prepared a message on the state of constitutional legality in the country, in which it recognized this state as unsatisfactory, in total, in whole or in part, 17 normative acts signed by Lukashenko were recognized as unconstitutional. The Constitutional Court also noted that the executive power is to arbitrarily interpret in paragraph 1 of Article 100 of the Constitution, which determines the powers of the President of the country, in the opinion of the Court, the principle of separation of powers was violated in practice, since as a result of the unlawful strengthening of the power of the President, the role and importance of Parliament and the Court were belittled, Oleg Bogutsky recalls, it was necessary to specify the interpretation of the Articles of the Constitution in order to prevent the possibility of abuse of power. 
such an attempt was made by the Supreme Council of the Twelfth Convocation on the initiative of Bulakhov, but failed due to the carelessness of the opposition, as far as I remember, literally two or three votes were not enough, and at that time several deputies from the Belarus and Popular Front were wandering around the lobby, drinking beer in the cafeteria and flirting with journalists, but now the factions of communists and agrarians and the chairman of the Supreme Council simply ignored the proposals of the Constitutional Court, not wanting to conflict with Lukashenko. Moreover, Samyan Sharitsky, currying favor with the powerful violator of laws, withdraws from the Constitutional Court all requests for the constitutionality of presidential decrees, which were sent there by his predecessor, Michi Zohrib. The bitter experience of our predecessors traditionally does not teach anyone anything, Bogutsky continues. At that time, Grip gave a very good interview in one of the newspapers, where he said, they want to negotiate with the president, they could look at my experience, I also tried, and what did it lead to, Sharitsky's predecessor as speaker, Grip, as we know, readiness for compromise and accommodating did not lead to anything good, and they led Samyan Sharitsky to one of the very shameful pages in his biography 211. We are talking about his behavior in the story of the resignation of the Minister of Internal Affairs Yuri Zakharenko. How is it, Yura? Yuri Zakharenko, by the age of 38, rose to the rank of Colonel and Chairman of the Investigative Committee of the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Belarus. He received the general's shoulder straps and the ministerial portfolio from the hands of Alexander Lukashenko, but very quickly realized that the team that came to power did not at all consist of disinterested people. Well, for example, he received a flood of materials seriously compromising the presidential affairs manager Ivan Titenkov. However, information about the economic pranks of the supervisor of the republic was also available in the prosecutor's office. When I went to the prosecutor's office recalls Tatyana Pratko, they told me that they had a lot of material on Titankov. I understood that they, together with my specific case on the utilization of the state flag, AF, to call this material to Lukashenko. I was told that after that Titankov was about to leave, he came to Lukashenko sat, unhappy, and said, Well, Sasha, you just take care of our children, so that both your children and mine are provided for. Lukashenko was so touched by the children that he forgave him, and the most outrageous thing about this legend is that we can forgive a criminal offense, it must be assumed that Zakharenko managed to collect quite a lot of documents exposing Titankov, true, this young general and quite experienced investigator did not see the essence of what was happening or did not want to see it. After all, the documents he collected exposed more than one Titankov at all. Well, let's say, the profits of the infamous company Torgaxpo were associated with customs benefits, which is why the state suffered huge losses, tens and hundreds of millions, which were supposed to replenish the budget, thanks to the benefits provided to the company by presidential decree went straight to his office of affairs, but if the budget was controlled by the Supreme Council, then the funds of the administration of affairs were controlled only by Lukashenko, he provided benefits, and he disposed of the funds received from these benefits, naively believing that he was fighting only Titankov, Zakharenko was actually challenging Lukashenko himself, and he went too far, thinking that, by making the information public, he would force the president to deal with his corrupt supply manager, 
Zakharenko himself organized the leak of information about Torjaskpol to the press, and it was already too much. Not only did the Minister of the Interior evade participation in the evacuation of the deputies who went on a hunger strike, that is, he did not demonstrate his readiness to carry out any order of his commander-in-chief, so he also digs and dug out merges to journalists. Lukashenko dismissed Zakharenko from the post of minister with a ban, and in his usual manner, he publicly lowered the former comrade in arms. The expulsion of the head of the Ministry of Internal Affairs took place like in a bad political detective story. The president's son guards occupied the building of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Zakharenko was not even allowed to collect his personal belongings, and in the chair of the minister, concurrently, sat the state secretary of the Security Council, wholly devoted to the president, Viktor Shyman, on whom Lukashenko could rely as on himself. After waiting until things calm down a bit, the president will appoint Valentin Goltz as minister, who has already demonstrated his devotion and readiness for anything during the evacuation of the starving deputies of the Supreme Council, but the resignation of the Minister of the Interior, according to the Constitution, had to be agreed with the Supreme Council. I remember this meeting well, the hall was full. Journalists gathered for the session, as for a scandalous premiere in the theater, the floor was given to Yuri Zakharenko, the young general resolutely went to the podium and, visibly agitated, began to passionately explain to the highest legislative body of the country what was the reason for his removal from office, and here Samyan Sharitsky who never had a penchant for external effects, did something that the most sophisticated director would not have suggested to him. He suddenly got up, left the presidium table and went to the chair in which Lukashenko was sitting, and, defiantly turning his back on Zakharenko, he began to whisper something with the president. Naturally, the audience's attention automatically shifted to them. Zakharenko seemed to hit a wall, he turned around, looked at Sharitsky and realized that he was doomed, he really was doomed, as befits a self-respecting investigator, he could not publicly divulge the secret of the investigation, that is, tell the details and circumstances of the violation of laws by Lukashenko's close associates, and by the behavior of Sharitsky, he was completely shot down. As a result, the report turned out to be very vague, even those facts that were given in it looked unconvincing. Well, the demonstrative disregard for the former minister on the part of the chairman of the Supreme Council completed the overall impression, although no, it was completed by something completely different. When Zakharenko stepped down from the podium and sat down in his seat, the president took the floor. To the complete surprise of those present, Lukashenko did not refute his former minister, but spoke about the fact that he believed Yuri Nikolaevich like a son, although they were the same age, about how he promoted him to general, and he betrayed him, and the audience, looking at the whole performance, suddenly went limp, indeed, he made him a minister, indeed, he made him a general. And instead of gratitude, he began to dig, and under whom, under the father 212, it doesn't work well, here something quite unexpected happened, Oleg Bogutsky recalls, during the president's speech, Zakharenko got up and went towards the podium, the guards tensed up, they were ready to shoot at that moment, but Zakharenko came to his senses in time and sat down, not reaching the podium. Where and why did he go? What did you want to do? Maybe just ask the chairman to give him the opportunity to answer, or maybe he broke loose in order to defend his honor in the way that a real officer should in such cases. We will probably never know about it. Lukashenko again left the parliamentary rostrum as a winner, 
The president is worried Lukashenko has not yet had any particular disagreements with the parliamentary majority. The communists and agrarians happily sanctioned the replacement of state symbols in accordance with the results of the referendum. They also readily supported the news of the creation of the community of Russia and Belarus, and with regard to the management of the economy, the Supreme Council and the President had almost no differences, both Alexander Lukashenko and the deputies, for the most part, remained ideological supporters of the old Soviet economic model in which the chief distributes everything, however, Lukashenko understood that everything was not so good with the Supreme Council, after all, many of those who were dissatisfied with his course became deputies, yes, they were in the minority, but Lukashenko was a deputy himself quite recently and did not have time to forget how quickly the minority begins to set the tone for the parliamentary swamp, if this happens, if the same few liberals from the civil action faction, led by Stanislav Bogdankovich, managed to come to an agreement with a large party faction, communists or agrarians, and the mechanism for removing the president from power, impeachment, provided for by the constitution can be launched, after all, it is enough to collect the signatures of 70 deputies out of 199 and refer the case to the constitutional court and he has already been removed from power, there was no direct danger yet, but Lukashenko has well mastered the simple political axiom, if the parliament, no matter how selected and falsified, has real powers, it will want to exercise these powers at some stage, and the constitutional court, as we remember, already by February 1996 declared a number of presidential decrees inconsistent with the constitution, so that the grounds for impeachment were ripening, moreover, some of the deputies even then began to talk about him, deputy Vladimir Nistak recalls, the idea of impeachment arose in March 1996, with the late Gennady Karpenko in his office, we had a conversation on the topic that there is a mechanism that can influence the president, keep him in a tense state and force him to reckon with the opinion of the parliament, and we decided to try to see if we can collect statements of impeachment, my application was one of the first. These were still experimental statements, at that time we did not know the procedure for how it was all done, after consultations with the Constitutional Court, we learned the form that will be accepted by the court for consideration, it was a personal statement of each deputy, moreover, this statement was signed, and the signature was personally certified by the chairman of the Supreme Council with his signature and seal, then it took the form of a document, of course, Lukashenko knew that such experiments were already underway, it would be surprising if the person who alone controls the special services did not have information about this, and he begins to prepare a preemptive strike, to revise not individual points, but the foundations of the constitution, he needs to hurry, moreover, the people suddenly reminded themselves of themselves, opposition in the streets mass performances in the spring of 1996 were on the rise, first, on March 25, on the anniversary of the Belarusian People's Republic, a rally of many thousands took place on the Freedom Day, traditional for the Belarusian opposition, then, an action on April 2, in protest against the signing by Alexander Lukashenko and Boris Yeltsin of an agreement on the creation of the community of Russia and Belarus, 
Then, near the doors of the Russian embassy, it came to a real fight between supporters and opponents of the community. The most massive opposition protests took place on April 26, during the traditional Chernobyl way, but this time, its participants were not only against the consequences of Chernobyl, but also for the preservation of Belarus as a state. The agreement on the establishment of the community was perceived by representatives of the Belarusian society as a threat to the state sovereignty of Belarus. More than 50,000 people took part in the procession. If the demonstrators broke through to the presidential residence, and hot hats called for this, the consequences could be unpredictable. But the opposition leaders did not want clashes. Vyacheslav Sivchik, then the executive secretary of the Belarus and Popular Front administration, recalls, the route along which the demonstrators walked on the Chernobyl path in 1996 was agreed with the authorities, the coordination took place in the office of Gennady Karpenko, then vice speaker of the Supreme Council, representing the opposition faction civil action, F, there were the chief of the capital's police, Boris Tarletsky, one of the deputies of the city prosecutor, and someone else incognito from the KGB, there was Yuri Kodiko, deputy chairman of the Belarus and Popular Front, F, and it was there, in Karpenko's office, that the route was agreed upon, along which the demonstrators actually followed. At that time, I was already working as a columnist for Belruskaya Delova Gazeta. Having received the task, I left the editorial office and went to Namiga, where I was going to take a trolley bus. Having missed several crowded trolley buses, I suddenly realized that I was unlikely to be able to leave. A stream of people moved slowly along the roadway, white red white flags, now disgraced again, were flying, banners and banners were visible, the stream was slowly approaching, one could already feel the trembling of the asphalt, on which tens of thousands of people were walking. I managed to make out the deputies, Stanislav Shashkovich, Gennady Karpenko, Alexander Dobrovolsky, two people broke away from the main mass, tall broad-shouldered Gennady Karpenko and limping Professor Yuri Kodiko, both hurriedly went to negotiate with the Amman, which was blocking the road. The authorities clearly violated the agreements reached, although the demonstrators went exactly along the route that was agreed upon, another moment, and the stones flew into the riot police, hitting the transparent shields and metal helmets, this was the first time the opposition had physically resisted the authorities, the first and Perhaps, the only clash in which, as in the Battle of Borodino, both sides could consider themselves victorious, opposition, because it did not flinch and resisted without retreating, power, because it managed to hold back the onslaught of 50,000 people, true, from the side it was completely incomprehensible where and why people were going, where and why they were not allowed, on April 26, Zion and Pozniak appeared in Minsk, who had recently illegally escaped abroad together with Belarus and Popular Front spokesman Syar Hnomchik. The fact is that back in March 1996, the leadership of the Belarus and Popular Front was warned that a show trial was being prepared against the party, and the freedom of the Belarus and Popular Front leader was in jeopardy. Confirmation of this is easy to see in the story of Vyacheslav Sivchik. All special services were raised, and, for example, around the house where I live, a whole block was cordoned off. As I understand it, Lukashenko had another hysteria. At his command, all the security services went into a frenzy. Then, immediately, as soon as Zinan Pozniak and Sergei Nomchik were abroad, all this abruptly stopped, and representatives of the Minsk police and the prosecutor's office began to speak on television that there was nothing at all, 
Pozniak's departure immediately reassured the authorities. Lukashenko was always afraid of only one thing, mass demonstrations, and March April 1996 was just marked by mass demonstrations. The Popular Front convincingly demonstrated that it still exists as a real force. To come to terms with this, after the seemingly victorious referendum of 1995, Lukashenko could not in any way, after all, any demonstration of independence or disobedience seemed to him like a stone that, having rolled from the top, could cause an avalanche and bring down the entire pyramid of power being built, therefore, he did not allow himself any concessions and was determined, the Belarusian Popular Front understood this, that is why the leaders of the front decided to emigrate Pozniak, after all, the political trial against the leadership of the Belarusian Popular Front would be meaningless if Zion and Pozniak had not been a defendant in this trial Vyacheslav Suchik believes, but Zin and Pozniak is back in Minsk. The news of his return, of course, caused excitement, and not only among the organs, but also among the opposition. After all, they do not return from emigration in order to surrender into the hands of the authorities. Is there really any hope of winning? The action started very powerfully, Sivchik recalls. The front prepared it very seriously. More than 200 Belarus and Popular Front combatants gathered behind the Octuba cinema, those who were supposed to prevent clashes between the police and the demonstrators. We calmly reached Jakob Kulis Square, where we were met by police cordons and where the first clashes took place. The authorities used gases, which was an obvious provocation, yes. And the cordons were put up absolutely provocatively, who put scars across the procession, which included, according to various estimates, from 30 to 70,000 people. There is no such. When the attack on people began, the situation became completely uncontrollable. The special units were broken through, and people went to Jakob Kulis Square. Many of our heads were smashed there. And then these beatings were demonstrated at the rally, it looked very scary, it was especially hard to look at a retired lieutenant colonel who had been pierced in the hat, he took off his bloody shirt, and I will never forget when he walks around the special forces and shows the fighters, who, by age, could be his children, what they did, Pozniak appeared suddenly. He spoke at the rally, angrily condemned the authorities surrendering the sovereignty of the country to Imperial Russia, and, unexpectedly for everyone, called on the audience to honor the memory of the recently deceased Chechen President Jokar Dudayev with a minute of silence. What does Dudayev have to do with it? No one understood, but did not mind either, so a moment of silence turned out by itself and Pozniak disappeared, just as suddenly as he appeared, his participation in Belarus and public politics ended with this, giving way to a myth, the hot spring of 1996 ended with nothing, the bulk of the demonstrators were young people, these were the same boys who, at the time of Alexander Lukashenko's election as president, had just received the right to vote, and many did not even get it, in 1994, the elders made the choice for them, the boys, the last Belarus and Romantics, went out into the street to show that they are already becoming a force, but they were not supported by those who considered themselves also in power, the majority of deputies tacitly condemned the mass riots, but since several parliamentarians were still at the head of the column, Lukashenko's sense of danger increased. What will happen if those deputies who have already begun experiments with impeachment manage to come to an agreement with the street? As always, sensing the impending danger, 
Lukashenko sought to demonstrate strength, Yeltsin will not be denied he had the opportunity to show his strength, the hot spring of 1996, which ended in nothing, nevertheless put forward its heroes, they were Yuri Koldiko and Vyacheslav Sivshik, who ended up in prison on cases initiated for participation in the March opposition rallies. At first, almost all the leaders of the front, who were in Belarus, were all detained recalls Vyacheslav Sivshik. Then a gradual process of liberation began, and, in the end, only Kodiko and I ended up in Belodarka, the main prison of Minsk. F. They began to show strength on them. The task of the authorities was to compromise the very idea of resistance as much as possible. To do this, it was necessary, firstly, to link the personalities of the prisoners and Pozniak, who had fled abroad, and secondly, to force them to condemn the rallies, the front, and the opposition in general, that is, to break them, and to show, even such stubborn ones gave up, Vyacheslav Sivshik says, all attempts at interrogations began with Zinan Pozniak, the scheme is primitively KGB scheme, here you are sitting, starving, suffering, and at that time he is enjoying abroad, but the interrogated did not break down, firmly stood their ground, they considered Pozniak an inflexible leader and the symbol of the nation, they did not admit their guilt in violating the law, since they complied with all the agreements reached, and they were clearly not going to condemn their own actions and the very idea of the Chernobyl way, but the authorities were not going to let them go unbroken, like, there is no repentance, we will bring the case to court, both Yuri Koldiko and Vyacheslav Sivshik were forced to take extreme measures, in protest, they went on an indefinite hunger strike, Alas, it was a hunger strike of two loners, the party did not support them with any practical actions, no one pitched tents in the squares, no one went on hunger strikes as a sign of solidarity, everyone was limited to words of sympathy, appeals, letters, protests, nothing more. Pozniak from abroad generally stated that the place of a politician is not in prison, but at large, this allowed Lukashenko to remain silent expectantly, outwardly not reacting in any way to what was happening, neither to the appeals of parties, human rights organizations, creative intelligentsia, nor even to an open letter from Sivshik's mother. He probably hoped that in the end the two starving people would be forced to repent, but Koldiko and Sivshik were not going to give up either, they were determined to defend their cause even at the cost of their own lives. The tragic outcome was prevented by Russian President Boris Yeltsin, a man who came to the heights of power from the democratic camp. Yeltsin was forced to reckon with the opinion of democratic voters, and when the leader of the Russian Yabloko party, Grigory Yavlinsky, one of Yeltsin's rivals in the 1996 elections, asked him to intervene, Yeltsin called Lukashenko and added his voice to those who petitioned for the two prisoners who were starving in Minsk, Lukashenko could not refuse Yeltsin. He probably already imagined how soon he himself would need the loyalty of Tsar Boris, Koldiko and Sivshik were released, I'll deal with Parliament, and the President of Belarus began to prepare for the second round of the fight for complete and unconditional power over the country, he feared the possibility of impeachment, and since only a radical change in the constitution gave a guarantee to avoid it, Lukashenko decided to prepare a referendum for such a change. In the summer of 1996, he begins a campaign for its holding. Olga Bramova, then an opposition-minded deputy of the Supreme Council, recalls, already in June, the referendum plan was ready, I found out about this by accident, 
one of the deputies, who sympathized with me and belonged to the ruling group, decided to say goodbye to me before the summer vacation, it was a touching farewell, an expression of regret that we were parting, the view was as if we were parting forever, I was surprised and asked, what, are you leaving somewhere, he said, not, it is you who are leaving, and I am staying, meaning that soon we will no longer have the opportunity to meet in the Supreme Council, there will be a referendum, and then he told me about everything that awaits us, about the bicameral parliament, about the fact that there will be no opposition in it, about changing the form of government and much more. Lukashenko himself spoke about the referendum unexpectedly, it happened during his June meeting with the deputies of the German Bundestag, then it was said, don't worry about the parliament, I will deal with the parliament by legal means, through a constitutional referendum, at the same meeting, it was said that the opposition deputies were behaving simply outrageously, how would you behave in my place, being the head of state, if the deputies of your parliament led various kinds of street actions, to which the conservative Kridna, the head of the delegation, said, there are two women deputies here, representatives of the Green Party, they regularly led mass protests and are in the forefront, this is a normal tradition of a democratic society 213. But Lukashenko cared little about the traditions of a democratic society, he was worried about something else, a presidential parliamentary republic could easily become a parliamentary presidential one, and Sharitsky, it seems, realized only in August that the referendum was indeed inevitable, I guessed when all the chairmen of the regional executive committees arrived at the extended meeting of the Presidium of the Supreme Council, they came just to look, but even from the tone, how they behaved, how they talked, it was already clear that they felt themselves masters of the situation 214, indeed, the governors appointed by the president, who knew well how the head of state treats the parliament and what his intentions were, looked down on the leadership of the Supreme Council, even the chairman of the Grodno Regional Executive Committee, Alexander Dubko, who had recently been an activist of the Agrarian Party, was nominated by it as a presidential candidate, was friends with Sharitsky, now behaved arrogantly, if not contemptuously, and only by the behavior of this former party comrade in arms, the chairman of the Supreme Council of the 13th Convocation, Samyan Sharitsky, realized that the legislative branch was no longer a power, and that the Supreme Council is doomed, and what to fight, Chapter 2 to be or not to be members collect signatures Lukashenko has always been distinguished by his ability to sense danger from a distance, he had just become president when he realized how dangerous the constitutional court was for him personally, it had to be tightly and constantly controlled, the chairman of the constitutional court, as we remember, was Valery Tikinia, a doctor of jurisprudence, who at a very mature age got involved in public politics and agreed to become secretary of the Central Committee of the CPB, but it was at this moment that the communist system collapsed, and no one needed Tikinia, he had a deputy mandate, but no one intended to let him into real politics, Lukashenko, having come to power, post. He held out just long enough for Tikinia to understand, in order to have the constitutional court de jure, even being its undisputed leader, it is necessary to win the favor of the president, to prove his indisputable loyalty to him, and Tikinia understood, Leonid Sinitsin recalls, the appointment of Valery Tikini left me with an unpleasant impression, their conversation with the president was extremely frank, to the point of cynicism, Tikina specifically said, as long as you are president, I promise you that I will never allow impeachment, there was no compromising evidence, no threats, 
Tikinia himself understood everything and simply asked, and he kept his promise, in this sense, he turned out to be a decent person, looking ahead, let's say that he really turned out to be a decent person and kept his word of honor, if only it can be considered decency, after all, Tikinia kept his word at too high a price, it is difficult to say to what extent, during his appointment, Tikinia foresaw the future development of events, but the fact that a person with his experience and his legal competence could not help but see that Lakashenka violates laws and will continue to violate them is beyond doubt, already from the first clashes between the President and the Constitutional Court, this became clear, moreover, according to Mikhail Pastokhov, Valery Gurevich knew that the Supreme Council was preparing to collect signatures for the impeachment of Lukashenko, and, I must say, the majority of judges of the Constitutional Court could quite objectively support this initiative of the deputies and state the fact that Lukashenko has repeatedly violated the Constitution, which would serve as a basis for his removal from office. Deputy Vladimir Nistuk, a participant in the events, says, the collection of signatures has begun, two oppositional factions very quickly collected these signatures, collected them Karpenko, he had all our statements in his safe 215, Olga Abramova, there were two categories of signatories, first, people who were convinced that a referendum was wrong, that changing the constitution was wrong, but there were also those who simply succumbed to the influence of events, the influence of strong deputies, and those who thought about their own fate and wanted to stay in parliament for some more time, not being so strongly attached to politics. The collection of signatures was far from smooth. The votes of the liberals from the civil action faction and the social democrats were not enough. It was necessary to persuade the farmers and the communists. The communist faction was massive and at that time very manageable continues below the Mirnist yuk. Everyone saw that the pencil was raised in Kalyakin's hand and the faction voted as indicated by this pencil, if up, then for, if down, then against, and the communists began to give their signatures literally in the last days, Sergei Kalyakin recalls, there was a lot of talk about impeachment, it was not an easy question, when we decided that these signatures should be collected, we immediately collected them, there was no delay for anyone, the process of collecting signatures was completed by mid-November, there remained, as they say, a technical issue, to take the deputies' signatures to the Constitutional Court, which was supposed to accept them for consideration. The Constitutional Court means Tikinia, the one who, according to Sinitsin, promised Lukashenko before his appointment to the post of chairman of the court that he would not allow impeachment, Tikina keeps her word and now the former minister of internal affairs Yuri Zakharenko brings to the office of the chairman of the constitutional court the statement of the deputies with the originals of their signatures, probably. This was entrusted to Zakharenko in the expectation that he would not be stopped by the police officers on duty at the entrance, and in the event of the use of force, the general, who was not deprived of the right to carry weapons, would be able to protect the precious package. Following Zakharenko, judges Mikhail Pastokhov and Alexander Vashkovich are trying to get into Tikina's office. Pastokhov recalls, it was impossible to get to the chairman, the secretary said that he had an acquaintance who was discussing some important legal issues with Valery Gurevich, we waited for him to be released, it took almost an hour, nevertheless, we went into the office of Valery Gurevich, and there he had a tall, thin man of about 50, as I later found out, it was Anatoly Mordasov member of the government of the Republic of Belarus, 
president of the concern Belnaft Kamanatoli Mordasov came to the office of the chairman of the Constitutional Court Valery Tikini, why, it is unlikely that he would have risked coming to Tikina without the authority to negotiate 216, Mikhail Pastukhov continues. Valery Gurevich was very depressed, obviously embarrassed by something, he said, sorry, I can't talk to you yet, I have to leave for one hour now, and left, we went to our office, literally 15 minutes later, a journalist calls me and asks, is it true that Tikinia went to the presidential administration, this cannot be, after all, I knew that Zakharenko brought the appeal of the deputies with signatures, moreover, I know that the deputies had an agreement with Tikinia that the signatures of the deputies themselves would not be made public until the start of the trial, but only the text of the appeal itself would be announced. Colonel Mikhail Pastukhov, a former lecturer at the Department of the National Security Institute, formerly the Minsk School of the KGB, had a good idea of how all this could turn out both for the very idea of impeachment and for its initiators. Valery Gurevich returned from the president and said that he asked us not to consider this case, this appeal, but for now we waited. Most of the judges were indignant. How can we not consider this? Tikinia was forced to appoint a meeting of judges. To my horror and surprise, I saw some judges have copies of not only the appeal of the deputies, but also the signatures of the deputies. To the question, where did the signatures come from? I received an answer. Well, according to the law, according to the regulations, we must submit an appeal to the judges. Valery Gurevich handed over this package with signatures to me as a judge reporter and said, OK, prepare a decision, but the signatures were also in the presidential administration. How, Valentina Sviatskaya says, the lists were submitted to the Constitutional Court, how they ended up with Alexander Grigoryevich, I think Tikinia should answer this question, naturally, the processing of those deputies who signed was immediately started, after all, no one could force Lukashenko to sit idly by and wait for impeachment, everyone had a choice they handled it the best they could, let's take a look at some evidence, Valentina Sviatskaya, the processing was terrible, one of the Grodno deputies said that Dubko, chairman of the regional executive committee, A, F, came to him and knelt in front of him so that he withdrew his signature, I, he says, gave in, because I simply could not bear it, it is impossible to influence the other, so there was just physical pressure, they began to psychologically work on his family, cars with headlights on stood around the house and shone through the windows at night, some people have been fired from their jobs, Khalil Bax told me, his daughter was finishing school, she was pulling for a medal, so the principal of the school came into the classroom, picked her up and said bluntly that her father was almost an enemy of the people, since he went against the president, almost like in 1937, there was also pressure on the communists, Sergei Kalyakin recalls, a number of people in our faction were simply broken. They threatened that the children would lose their jobs, that they would put someone in jail. We had two deputy heads of the faction who were women, and men, as you know, always go to women to cry. They walked and told what scoundrels they were, how they could not do anything, because their children were suffering. The story of the head of the communist faction, Sergei Kalyakin, is supplemented by a member of the civil action faction. Valery Krugovoy, I witnessed how they forced me, a literal witness for example, how Deputy Kadinov was forced, when we were sitting in his room, he was from other cities, he lived in a hotel, Pyotr Prokopovich arrived and, like an old acquaintance, began to explain to him that he had taken the line incorrectly, it is necessary, they say, to revoke the signature, 
he understands how this could end, it will be completely ruined, and there will be no light, but these are soft persuasions, but Kaczynski pressed very simply, that's what he said to Volodya Kadinov, you'll sit and they'll drive a stake in your ass, then you'll remember, one collective farm chairman called me at home and said, Valera, come here, because they will come to me to twist my arms, I want you to be there, they will be afraid in your presence, the deputy chairman of the regional executive committee openly told him, let's let you and the collective farm go around the world, and all people will know that they went around the world thanks to you, you will know, we'll jail your accountant, etc., those were the threats, and here is what Vladimir Nistyuk says, Deputy Vasily Sukovich came up to me in the morning at a meeting of the Supreme Council and said, active trading begins, he said with a smile and left, it meant that they were beginning to make promises, I, in general, let it go past my ears, and then my assistant comes in and says that Shimon is waiting for me, I arrived at the administration, went up to Shimon, the question was put directly, in the situation in which Lukashenko finds himself today, he needs support and help, we need to decide, either you still have a chance to be on our team and take some place, worthy, very worthy, or you cross out everything, burn bridges and stand on the other side of the barricades, and when the conversation came to offers of what could be obtained in return for my withdrawing the previous application, I simply said that it's not very convenient when officers talk about such things, there are some principles, ultimately, there is family, friends, people around, who then need to look into the eyes, how can you live if you don't respect yourself, such was the gentlemanly conversation between two former members of the same campaign headquarters of Lukashenko, two former political workers, Nistak and Shimon, Nistyak continues, and before that, Valery Krugovoy came out of the office, white as a sheet, and took back his application. Valery Krugovoy recalls, indeed, we met with Nistak in the corridor, he was in a very good mood, I confess that I was also in a good mood, because, yes, I left the office, where Mr. Shimon drew very rosy prospects for me, I was told, Valery, you know very well that a criminal case is underway, a long time ago, you know perfectly well that if you don't remove the signature, Things will end badly, not only for you, it will end badly, it will end badly for those who worked with you together, so think, it wasn't a threat, they didn't say the way they did to others that if you don't withdraw your signature, then we will start a case, I was simply reminded, you have been walking under the sword for a long time, this sword will fall, I said, okay, I'll think about it. Then Volodya Kadinov and I discussed this topic, they openly told him, you will sit down, you will sit in full, Volodya says to me, in the coffin, I saw them all, my grandfather was in some time there, and I will serve 217, I say, unlike you I'm not going to sit, all the more so to substitute people who are in this matter neither by ear nor by spirit. Well, everyone had a choice, all of them, except Lukashenko, as in 1994, he was the only one who, in case of defeat, had no place on the political stage, Kalyakin had a party, Sharitsky reached the peak of his party political career just in time for retirement, the rest of the oppositionists had a chance to wait for re-election to the new parliament, of course, provided that the authorities would observe at least some democratic norms, Lukashenko lost everything, where should he go, return to the farm, but even there, there would be no place for a president subjected to a humiliating impeachment procedure, and for all his nationwide popularity, 
he simply would not be allowed to be re-elected for the second time 218. Yes, Lukashenko himself understood well what he would do in their place with a losing opponent and with what pleasure 219. No, Lukashenko simply could not afford to lose. He had to win by mobilizing all his will and energy, and this energy of his was transferred to officials who worked in the structures of executive power. They saw before them a player capable of anything. This is not the senile sluggish Sharitsky for you. In addition, they have already got used to Lukashenko. They knew what to expect from him, but what the new government will do is still unknown. And then, if not with him, then where, in opposition, and what should an official do in opposition, although the parliament did everything possible to persuade the government to defend constitutional legality, but, as Vasily Leonov assures, we did not discuss the topic of the referendum in the government 220, he is corrected by the Minister of Labor Alexander Suznov, once an order comes from the administration, to appear at some kind of headquarters, this happened in the Ministry of Communications, we got there, it turned out that this is the headquarters for the preparation of the referendum, some kind of brainstorming was held there, some proposals were heard, what to do, where from, what and how, etc., then they distributed, who should be assigned to which region. Personally, I got the Gomel region, I had to drive around the district, see the level of preparation for the referendum, check the mood of the people, talk with the leadership and find out what they think of themselves, how they think to hold a referendum. I went on a business trip several times and realized that there would be a decision that the president needed, everything was ready, the local authorities were ready. The local vertical workers were set in the right direction, no one had any doubts, and even this well-known vote yes 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 no, it seems that it sounded like that, I don't remember, everyone was already on hearing, like a pioneer slogan 221, so I just got scared, what were they fighting for, what did Lukashenko want? First of all, avoid impeachment. To do this, it was necessary to complicate the procedure for removing the president from power as much as possible, ensuring control over everyone who should participate in it. Therefore, under the new constitution, the president personally appoints half of the members of the Central Election Commission, half of the judges and the chairman of the Constitutional Court, to entrust the appointment of the remaining judges to deputies directly elected by the people. Lukashenko also did not dare and came up with the upper house of parliament, the Council of the Republic. The members of the Council of the Republic are elected by the deputies of the regional councils under the control of the executive committees, and eight members of the council are personally appointed by the president. The Council of the Republic meets twice a year by decree of the president, as does the lower house of parliament, the house of representatives and therefore the possibilities to entreat the deputies of both chambers are extremely limited. Lukashenko did not want to share real power with the parliament, in particular, control over the activities of the government, if, according to the 1994 constitution, the president coordinated with the Supreme Council the appointment and resignation of the prime minister, his deputies, Silovics, the ministers of finance and foreign affairs, then after the referendum it will be necessary to coordinate only the candidacy of the prime minister, and his resignation does not require the consent of the parliament. Lukashenko also took away the right of control from the parliament, liquidating the control chamber subordinate to the Supreme Council and subordinating the prosecutor's office and the specially created state control committee. The president also had in his hands such a powerful weapon as the threat to dissolve parliament. 
Thus, the so-called constitutional reform of 1996 in fact came down to the destruction of the existing balance of branches of power, to the removal from the constitution of those norms of law that could lead the president to the loss of power 222, and in order to shift the responsibility for the attempt of a fundamental revision of the constitution onto the deputies, they were given the idea, to submit to the same referendum an alternative draft of the basic law, which would eliminate the presidential post as such, and the deputies, but, now Lukashenko's hands were completely untied, he could always say that it was not only he who was shaking the foundations of constitutional legality in the country, but also the parliament, everyone has their own wedding but even after spinning the flywheel of the referendum, Lukashenko was not calm, he felt the internal resistance of the state apparatus, officials are like silkworms, they can spin their yarn only in a soft and calm cocoon, they were little interested in the text of the constitution to be put to a referendum, they were worried about something else, the preservation of at least some stability, on the one hand, they did not want the impeachment of the president, which would be followed by a restructuring of the entire government, on the other hand, I did not want to live without a parliament, since it was also a branch and at the very least ensure the balance, no one wanted breakage and upheaval, everyone knew that both the president and the supreme council were elected, and therefore legitimate, everything seemed to be in order here, but the supreme council was elected later, and therefore its legitimacy was formally more, so to speak, fresh, therefore, Lukashenko felt the need to show the public confirmation that he still enjoys the support of the people, this is how the idea of holding the old Belarusian National Assembly appeared, most likely, this meeting was invented by Mikhail Myosnikovich, the new head of the administration had to score points, proving his importance, including in matters of ideological support, his proposal was simple as a rake, and just as reliable, to gather in the Minsk Palace of Sports a kind of nationwide assembly, 5,000 people, supposedly representing the entire Belarusian people, so that the head of state could consult with them and get nationwide approval of the idea referendum, everything that follows is known since Stalin's times, labor collectives and public organizations, or rather, what since Stalin's times were considered public organizations, vied with each other to challenge each other for the right to nominate the best representatives of state power as delegates to the all Belarusian assembly, of course, starting with the sovereign, the mandates were awarded to the prime minister, the head of the administration, and some representatives of the deputy corps, of course, loyal to the president, receiving a mandate unambiguously meant that you remained in a certain clip, that your devotion was noticed by the head of state, members of the government were seated in a special enclosure, the picture was interesting, you could see from the faces of the ministers that they felt like they were in sheet 223, the last remark is absolutely true, people were taken to the forum in buses, trying to limit their contacts with Minsk residents as much as possible, who clearly did not approve of the idea of a referendum, through the slightly misted windows of the buses one could see frightened faces, more like those of random visitors to places of detention, and not arbiters of people's destinies, in the same way, they tried to protect the assembly delegates from unwanted questions from dishonest, as Lukashen says, journalists of the non-state press, the guards did not let even the leaders of the Supreme Council, for example, the chairman of the Commission on International Affairs Pyotr Krovkenko, who frankly tried to get into the hole, go there, like, you have your own wedding, we have our own, weddings and in fact everyone had their own, 
the opposition countered the presidential event with the old Belarus and Congress in defense of the Constitution, against the dictatorship, scheduled for the same day at the Palace of Trade Unions, the whole of Minsk was actually brought into a state of emergency, there were trucks full of soldiers in the yards, special forces soldiers, wearing masks, armed with machine guns and with dogs, patrolled the city, the Palace of Sports, where the watch was held, was surrounded by armored personnel carriers and water cannons, the role of the representative of heavenly justice in the presidential version was assigned to Metropolitan Filarate, the patriarchal exarch of all Belarus could not but understand what he was to participate in, they say that, having returned from the assembly and being a man not alien to irony, he commented on what had happened in the following way, earlier, they just sent invitations, but now they also attach a report, referring to the text of his speech prepared in the administration, Semyon Sharitsky and his first deputy Vasily Novikov refused to participate in both actions, the motive was simple. Parliament was above the fray, the leaders of the parliament obviously could not get support at the presidential dissent, and they did not dare to join the political opposition, from this, the alternative democratic congress greatly corrected, the left wing of the Supreme Council, the communists and the agrarians did not participate in it, and the whole action turned into an inter-party get-together of the right. The initiators of the Congress did not reach the main goal, the unification of all opposition forces, the organizers of the meeting in support of the president did not achieve what they wanted either, people in the audience understood that they were expected to support them, but what should be supported, the idea of a referendum. But the Supreme Council was not formally against the referendum, since it submitted its own draft constitution to it. In fairness, it should be said that many delegates internally resisted the inexorably impending referendum. This was evident from the speech of the first speaker, chairman of the Brest Regional Executive Committee Vladimir Zalomai. He seemed to have no idea what was expected of him and spoke only about economic problems, despite the fact that Lukashenko impatiently pushed, speak, they say, to the point, but essentially, it seems, Zalome did not want to say, the most oppositional was the speech of Prime Minister Mikhail Chichar, everything about the economy, about the economy, about the economy, it was clear that this was a form of protest that the quiet and peaceful beekeeper chose for himself 224. On the first day, Lukashenko was very wary of the audience 225. The president, sensing this mood, had to do something to prevent the disruption of the event. After the report and several speakers, a break was announced. Immediately after the break, Lukashenko took the stage and said, I see that you all have a bad attitude towards this idea, the referendum will be advisory in nature, you can calm down, the majority, and I, a sinner, including, then still believed that the president's word was really worth something 226, and everyone calmed down, moreover, the meeting was competently orchestrated by Mikhail Myosnikovich, as a result of which potential opponents simply did not get the floor. Goncharik recalls, I wrote several notes to Myosnikovich, being on the presidium, I asked for the floor, no words were given, only ten people in the hall voted against the resolution, no more, I am the only one in the presidium who raised the mandate against, in response to a bewildered exclamation from the hall, I again raised the mandate against, Lukashenko reacted calmly to this 227. But the president himself was dissatisfied, he was forced to make concessions, and this was not in the rules of Alexander Lukashenko, he was afraid to seem weak even for a minute, even in small things, 
Moreover, his formal agreement to abandon the mandatory nature of the referendum did not at all entail the Parliament's rejection of the idea of impeachment, just as the referendum hung like an axe over the Supreme Soviet, so the impeachment was carried over the President's neck possibility of compromise rejected in addition, impeachment became more and more likely, Parliament suddenly began an invasion of the Holy of Holies of the new government, it decided to check the office of the President, the task was entrusted to the Chamber of Control, which was subordinate to Parliament 228, the head of the Control Chamber, Vasily Sukovic tried to take a compromise position, setting out a number of facts that deliberately compromised the business manager Ivan Titenkov, but only from those that had already been announced in the press, the former secretary of the regional committee of the Communist Party, Sukovic, was not new to maneuver 229. According to Sukovic, a number of documents requested by the control chamber in the office of the president have not been provided to the inspectors, and the parliament did not have the tools to force the presidential structures to submit. The Ministry of Internal Affairs, the KGB, the prosecutor's office were already completely focused on the president and the decision of the Supreme Council was practically ignored. However, the very fact that the deputies dared to discuss allowed the sources of the presidential funds and budgets of the Department of Affairs cut off any possibility for compromises. Lukashenko did not seek a compromise. Under his control, the deputies were processed so that they would withdraw the signatures put under the appeal to the Constitutional Court. This was task number one, and now Deputy Chairman of the Supreme Council Yuri Malumov, lying in the hospital of the presidential administration, accepts more and more deputies' applications for the withdrawal of signatures. Contrary to all legal norms, Malumov, who is on sick leave, personally assures them 230 after which the renegades rush to the nearby building of the Constitutional Court in order to testify their transition to the side of the potential winner 231, there seemed to be only two obstacles ahead, it was necessary not only to win, but also to achieve recognition of this victory by the Constitutional Court and the Central Election Commission and the Central Election Commission was one of the obvious centers of opposition, because it was headed by Victor Guncha, Chapter 3, Accent Shopping Block 2 Wolves Victor Guncha, no doubt, was one of the brightest politicians, to whom Paris Troika opened the way to the heights of power in Belarus, these were the childhood years of Belarus and public politics, Gorbachev opened the floodgates, and so many Soviet Demosphans and Cicerons were brought to television screens that those who wished could only choose a suitable model for themselves. Guncha did not hide the fact that he was guided by the model of behavior of the People's Deputy of the USSR, St. Petersburg Professor Sobchik. He was generally cynically frank, relying on the influence of his personality. The similarity of manners even looked somewhat comical. Sobchik, going out to the microphone, regularly introduced himself, naming the name and number of the district. Guncha literally copied him even in intonations, both directly drummed into the public their last name, their intonations. Families fell in love with Guncha. He was young, handsome and confident. Film director Yuri Kashchevatsky remembers 232, initially, Potter even irritated me, I don't like female tantrums at all, and all the ladies I knew fell in love with him hysterically, not politically, but physically, a little later, I fully appreciated his excellent legal training, but it was thanks to her that it was extremely difficult to work with Guncha for cinema, even under the lens of a movie camera, 
he tried to choose words as accurately as possible, to formulate phrases, which made him seem tense, as if he had swallowed a stick, and only later, in the last period of our communication, I saw his charming smile and felt his undoubted charisma, it was the charisma of a bright, resolute person who clearly knows what he wants from life, Guncha wanted to be a politician, and independent, and, despite the Sapchkovsk image, he became independent, and that means lonely, more lonely than him, in our politics, perhaps, was only Alexander Lukashenko, however, loneliness is not always a misfortune for a politician, there are simply pack policies, mob policies, collective policies, a politician becomes a loner when, having weighed everything, he realizes that there is a chance to hit a fairly large jackpot, once on the direct road to power, the politician loses all desire to share the booty, this is called the lust for power, the potter wanted power, he, we repeat, was young, smart and ambitious, he understood that it would not be possible to hit a big jackpot alone, that he needed to play an intermediate, team game, but even playing in a team, he could always throw out an unexpected and spectacular feint, such, for example, as when Stanislav Shashkovich finally decided to offer him the post of Vice Speaker in the Supreme Council of the Twelfth Convocation, we know about their conversation on this score, the potter agrees, thanks, a misted bottle, a lemon, a piece of sausage is removed from the refrigerator in the speaker's office, the upcoming promotion is soaked, and the next morning Guncha comes to the podium and scandalously withdraws his candidacy, they say, if it weren't for your hands, Stanislav Stanislavovich, I would have accepted this Monomax cap, but from yours, excuse me, you can imagine Shashkovich, frozen with an open mouth surprise, for nothing, it turns out, they drank, but this is no accident, Guncha calculated everything, the fact that the parliamentary majority, although they respected him, did not like him, and therefore could vote for him, and the fact that Shashkovich was losing his already not very high popularity before our eyes, and the fact that the post of vice speaker is not power at all, having staked on Lukashenko, Guncha had a good idea of what kind of material he was dealing with, but he stubbornly believed that power is still the privilege of intellectuals, and not people who are not even able to clearly formulate their own thoughts, Lukashenko was just a ram for him, with which he hoped to break the old, decrepit system of power and open the way for the young, it is now obvious that there were simply no young wolves as a kind of political group capable of long-term coordinated actions, there were only two people equal to each other in willpower and first for power, to not even wolves, but a wolf hunt, Lukashenko and Guncha, two equally sentimental and, perhaps, equally ambitious, the same Pozniak next to them was quite harmless, despite the threats and rumblings, but at that stage they were necessary to each other, let Guncha need only a ram, but Lukashenko wanted to have the face of a politician with clear goals and the ability to achieve them, the potter, his very presence nearby, helped to create such an image, but Lukashenko's attitude towards him was ambivalent, using Guncha for his own purposes and constantly feeling his superiority, he could not help suspecting a competitor in him, that is why, after the victory, he did not expel Guncha, but did not bring him closer either, he gave him a piece, made him vice premier, and thereby rather dampened a potential rival, realizing that for a truly ambitious politician to accept the role of the fifth or tenth person in power structures means to admit his inferiority, even in Soviet times, when receiving an invitation to a new job, sober people always ask themselves, and where will I go then, up, down, to the side or immediately retire, 
from the post of Deputy Prime Minister for Social Affairs in a state with a weak economy, there was only one direction, down, at best, a sight, but Guncha was not at all upset by such an appointment, he considered this position only as a start, he has already figured everything out, Vice Premier, Prime Minister, and, of course, the President, and not fake as he considered location made by their common efforts, but a real one, decisive, intelligent, educated, powerful, he was frankly bored, with all these Shimans, Titankovs, Konoplevs, it seemed to him that he was already called up and went to the start, and they called, it turns out, not him, but them. Bloody offended, offended Potter slammed the door, but no one understood him, no one supported him, even the appeal to the chairman of the KGB, Vladimir Yegrov, to make public the real circumstances of the Leo's no incident, as we remember, hung in the air, and the point is not that this officer turned out to be not gentleman enough, but that no one was interested in it, as it sounded from the lips of a person who had already been written off by the authorities as an expense. After such a resignation, Guncha could simply disappear from the political arena, as happens in similar situations with many, but it didn't disappear. His wife, Zinaida Guncha, recalls, firstly, the person is already ill with politics, it is indeed a disease, and contagious, because together with Victor the whole family fell ill, secondly, as a normal man, he did not want to agree with the orders that Lukashenko began to impose, something had to be changed, he always said, well, at least our child should live in a normal country, shoot, therefore, when he said that he would go to the deputies, I was both for and against, but I understood that he needed it. Victor Guncher is trying to take revenge in 1995. Guncher was elected a deputy of the Supreme Council of the 13th Convocation. This was not surprising. Firstly, he had not yet been forgotten, and secondly, Lukashenko had not yet managed to build up that system of counting votes, in which an undesirable victory becomes impossible. In the new composition of the parliament, Guncha did not strive too much to obtain a status C-233. He wanted more and directly said in an interview that the next president of Belarus should rise to the pinnacle of power from the Oval Hall, and Guncha took the first chance to break out onto this path, the referendum, more precisely, the position of the chairman of the Central Election Commission, became such a chance for her, the Russian deputies understood that with the referendum everything would be decided by the Central Electoral Commission, and for the position of its chairman, a person was needed who would not put up with any falsifications and frauds, with any violations of the law, in conditions when Lukashenko fairly openly staked on the administrative resource and everyone understood this, Guncha was in demand not only because, as a lawyer, he could understand the intricacies of all possible legal and administrative troubles, everyone knew that he would not bend and would firmly and to the end stand on the side of the law, out of principle, and if only because of the fact that he, with his well-known ambition, had to leave the offices of power so ingloriously, as for his presidential ambitions, no one at that moment cared about the career aspirations of the failed deputy prime minister, no one, except, of course, Lukashenko, who didn't need any external manifestations, his intuition, instinct, suspicion were too well developed, no wonder the potter is so eager for this position. The potter was really eager to work in the Central Executive Committee, Valentina Sviatskaya recalls, before Guncha was appointed chairman of the SEC, I had a meeting with him, for some reason, he considered that I, as the secretary of the Central Council of the Agrarian Party, could somehow influence the adoption of certain decisions by Speaker Sharitsky, 
and Guncher openly told me then that he would like to be predictable for Samyan Georgievich. Then, after some time, I found out that Tikinia, who was then the chairman of the Constitutional Court, also met with Sharitsky and recommended Sharitsky to consider Hunter as chairman of the Central Election Commission on September 5 to Lukashenko's obvious annoyance and with loud opposition from activists of the pro-presidential parliamentary faction consent, Guncha was elected head of the SEC, and then he saw that before him a huge field of activity, Zinaida Guncha says, he traveled around the republic, through the polling stations, returned and said, in my life I could not imagine that everything could be so neglected, they'll rig anything for you because the boys are off the hook, do people really not understand that they will have to bear responsibility for this, after all, only a madman can look at this with his eyes closed, Victor was indignant that the regents had already understood that they should do as they were told from above, and therefore, he says, no one even paid attention to all my remarks that the elections would not be recognized, that you would be punished for fraud. This whole electoral system, created by Lukashenko and his vertical in just a year and a half, Guncha set out to break. This would allow the SAC to become an independent force, a serious counterbalance to Lukashenko, and he develops a vigorous activity. He seeks the decision of the Constitutional Court, according to which the referendum can only be of a consultative nature, and, with the approval of the other members of the SAC, puts it on the ballot, conducts consultations with members of public structures that have assumed the responsibility to control the course of the referendum, as almost the main opponent of the current president, Guncha visits the State Duma of the Russian Federation, where he makes a number of loud statements about the decision of the Constitutional Court, about numerous violations of the law accompanying the organization of the referendum, about falsifications being prepared, but he made the main statement in the program Hero of the Day on the Russian TV channel, that due to numerous violations, he will not sign the final documents on the results of the referendum 234. Of course, Guncha was not politically neutral, as, in general, it should be the head of the Central Election Commission, although he was not on the side of the Supreme Council, this will come later, but Guncha was a lawyer. He saw how consistently and cynically Lukashenko tramples on the rule of law, and could not come to terms with this. Of course, his indignation was fueled by personal ambitions, but at that moment he really defended both the letter and the spirit of the Constitution, and he hurried to convey his resolute refusal to recognize the results of the referendum to both the Belarusian and Russian viewers in the hope that people would understand. This was a mistake that cost both Guncher and the country dearly, going into battle with his visor open. He seemed to get too carried away and forgot what a cold-blooded and treacherous opponent he had to deal with. Guncha really had every reason not to recognize the referendum as valid, if only because of the violations he recorded as chairman of the Central Election Commission. In addition, the Constitutional Court declared the referendum a consultative one which meant that the immediate introduction of the constitution approved by the referendum, bypassing the Supreme Council, would be a coup d'etat. Guncha was ready to resist all this, but he obviously hurried to declare his intentions and provoked Lukashenko into an unexpected and completely illegal step. On November 14, 1996, the president removed Huncha by force, the presidential security service carries out an armed seizure of the SAC premises and expels Huncha from his office, chairman of the Supreme Council Samyan Sharitsky and prosecutor general Vasily Kapitan, who tried to prevent arbitrariness are simply thrown out along with Guncha. Rank and file deputies who stand up for Guncher are even beaten, 
on the recommendation of Mikhail Sazanov and Yuri Malumov, the head of the legal department of the Bobrovsk City Executive Committee, Lydia Yermolshina, is appointed head of the SAC 235 is the only member of the Central Election Commission who publicly objected to Guncha. This ensured Lukashenko's victory, democracy on the chopping block I take the liberty of stating that the appointment of Lydia Yermolshin as SAC chairperson has led to catastrophic consequences for the Belarusian democracy, it was clear that this intelligent and ambitious woman would never miss the chance given to her by fate. She knew what results of the referendum Lukashenko needed, and I knew that in the new text of the Constitution there was a rule according to which the appointment of the chairman of the Central Election Commission depends only on the President, so, to please him is to secure your own future, it is not difficult to imagine what such determination cost her, to lie directly and frankly that there were no violations of the law, but she fought for her right to leave Bobrovsk, which had become so sick of her that everything could be neglected for the sake of it. The potter escaped from Malodakno, Labidko, from Olshmiany, Lukashenko, from Ryskovichi, Sharitsky, from Belazin. Why is she worse than them? The fact that they were lucky, but she was not. So she was unlucky until 1996, and now she will hold her bird happiness by the tail with such persistence that it will be easier for the bird to take off with her than to escape from her, Lydia Yermolshina. Yermolshina's appointment as head of the SAC made Lukashenko's victory in the referendum and the adoption of the constitution inevitable, like the fall of an axe that flew up and felt the effect of the law of universal gravitation, the axe was held by women's hands, and the Belarusian constitution lay on the chopping block, although there was still a chance, after all, the impeachment procedure has already begun. And if the Constitutional Court completes its work before the referendum, after all, judges should have at least an elementary instinct for self-preservation, all hopes for Moscow however, the impeachment did not take place, he was prevented, by the Belarusian Parliament, it was the Supreme Council that turned to the leadership of Russia with a request to act as an arbiter in the dispute between the Belarusian branches of power, which made the catastrophe inevitable, Sergei Kalyakin recalls, Russia at the beginning of the conflict, at least, stood on the side of the Supreme Council and tried to resolve the situation, fearing that the confrontation in Belarus could lead to some kind of deep conflict up to a civil war. At first, they seemed to want to find a compromise between the two branches of government in order to end this business peacefully, and around this was all the talk, what compromises we were asked, could the Supreme Soviet make? And what should the executive branch do so that the Supreme Council can remove the issue of impeachment? Sharitsky and the deputies hoped to get Moscow's support in their dispute with Lukashenko. The fact is that Semyon Sharitsky had a long-standing relationship with Yegor Stroyev says Valentina Sviatskaya, until August 1991. Strove was the secretary of the Central Committee of the KTSU for Agrarian Issues, and when the putsch happened, and all the secretaries were blacklisted and were unclaimed, Strove returned to his Oriol region and was terribly depressed, he was completely unemployed, that's when Sharitsky and Nikonov, the president of VAS KH Neil, went to the Oriol region to provide moral support to Strove, and Sharitsky believed that this gave him the right to consider him his friend, he counted on the participation and help of Strove, who knew what Lukashenko was like, but in Russia, 
political decisions were already made only by the president, and Boris Yeltsin at that time was not up to the Belarusian scandal. Just in the midst of all these events, he underwent a serious heart operation. It is clear that in a situation where the newly elected head of the Russian state was on the operating table, the Russian elite was more concerned about their own problems than the Belarusian ones, but, barely recovering from the operation, the Russian president immediately drew attention to the Minsk confrontation, on his direct instructions and with the blessing of Anatoly Chubai, head of the presidential administration of Russia, three top leaders of the country flew to Minsk, Prime Minister Viktor Chernomyrdin and speakers of both houses of the Federal Assembly Gennady Seleznev and Yegor Stroyev, the same strove initially, the zero option was proposed recalls Kalyakin, we refuse impeachment, Lukashenko, from holding a referendum, moreover, we agree that we are creating a constitutional commission that will work on improving the constitution. Here is the canvas, according to which they intended to work at a joint meeting, and not only our side, the parliament, but also the president gave the go-ahead for it, canvas canvas, that's just a drawing on it, as it turned out, the party is intended to embroider each one of their own, for both sides at that moment, the main thing was to force the enemy to retreat and they themselves, both the deputies and the president, were not going to retreat, it was obvious, Lukashenko was well aware that even if the impeachment was postponed, it would only be for a while, while the leadership of the Supreme Council, in turn, realized that Lukashenko would not come down until the rule paving the way for impeachment was removed from the constitution, Kalyakin continues, when the Russians arrived, the first conversation in the afternoon was in Parliament, in which both the chairman of the commissions and the leaders of the factions took part, everyone agreed on what position we should take, and Strove and Seleznev also agreed that a compromise could be found and some solution could be prepared. At the same time, negotiations were underway with the presidential side. It's hard for me to judge what happened there, but there, among other things, there was an indoctrination of the chairman of the Constitutional Court, and it was natural. Lukashenko groped for the weak point of the enemy, and who are the judges? It was amazing, not that the presidential side worked Valery Tikinia. This just absolutely fit into the general pattern of behavior of the executive branch, and the parliamentarians even foresaw this, as Valentina Sviatskaya recalls, when the already collected signatures were handed over to Tikina so that he could start the consideration procedure in the Constitutional Court, he was recommended not to meet with Lukashenko in any case, not to contact him, because they knew that Valery Gurevich would be pressure has been applied, it was surprising that, contrary to the recommendations of the deputies, Tikinia meets with Lukashenko, as a result of which the head of the Constitutional Court becomes a participant in negotiations with Muscovites. This is clearly contrary to all legal norms, according to which the court is obliged to remain out of politics, especially considering that it was on November 22, when Strove, Seleznev and Chernomyrdin arrived in Minsk, that a hearing was scheduled on the violation of the Constitution of the Republic of Belarus by the President, in fact, the first step towards impeachment, in what kind of negotiations with the defendant can the chairman of the court participate, Professor Mikhail Pastakhov, member of the Constitutional Court, who was one of the speakers in the impeachment case, recalls, the case was scheduled for November 22, all the speakers were ready, numerous witnesses were called, who knew something about the issuance of Lukashenko's decrees, which were declared unconstitutional, the necessary documents were collected, moreover, we, the judges' rapporteurs, even prepared a draft of the corresponding conclusion, 
but, as you know, in the evening, after 9 o'clock in the evening on November 21, a plane arrived with Chernomirden, Strov and Selesnev. I went home at about 8 o'clock, I specifically went to Tikina, I say, Valery Burevich, we are ready to consider the case, is there anything stopping us from seeing it, Valery Burevich assured, yes, everything is fine, get ready, just in case I took all the materials home, because at that time, along with the policeman, we also set up a post with some unknown people, and Tikini at that time already had psychics, they conjured over him for half an hour, inspired him, Sergei Kalyakin says, late in the evening we went to a meeting with the Russians, which was supposed to take place in Boiskovy Lane, in the House of International Relations, downstairs, in the basement, I, Sharitsky, Karpenko took part in this meeting on the part of our Supreme Council, Olga Abramova, Krovkenko also went there, but, as far as I know, he was cut off, Lukashenko, Vasilevich, Myosnikovich took part from the presidential site, then, Strov, Selesnev, Chernomirden and Srov, that was the company 236, the company, frankly, is extremely motley, if the head of his administration is next to the president, this is understandable, but Sergei Kalyakin points out that Grigory Vasilevich, a member of the Constitutional Court, represented the third presidential party 237 who, like any judge, is prohibited by the Constitution from engaging in politics, and what is participation in negotiations of this kind if not a political act, when Sharitsky and I entered the hall, we saw, Tikinia Kalyakin continues, for me it was a blow, and I immediately realized that the Constitutional Court would not make any decision on impeachment, and it doesn't even matter how these negotiations end, his very appearance there said it all, not to mention his behavior when he excitedly supported what Lukashenko was saying, this is really such an outstanding day in my life, very important decisions will take place here, Alexander Grigoryevich correctly says, despite the fact that the judge of the Constitutional Court cannot take sides at all, Tikinia openly took the side of the enemy, I told Sharitsky, in my opinion, the Constitutional Court has already decided everything about impeachment, Valentina Sviatskaya recalls, Sharitsky was crushed and killed by the betrayal of Tikin, he did not expect to meet him there, later he told me, I was shocked, because as soon as I entered the hall where the negotiations were taking place, this Russian trinity was already standing there, and Valery Gurevich literally threw himself on the table, these are the words of Sharitsky. He threw himself on the table, on this document, I had not yet had time to read it, but Valery Gurevich had already made his corrections, Samyan Georgievich Tikinia shouted in excitement, I have never seen a more perfect, more remarkable document, sign up soon, Sharitsky said, well, at least you stop, calm down. Was it so, I speak from the words of Sharitsky, it can be assumed that this was the case, and at that moment, the chairman of the Constitutional Court really, more than anything, longed for the end of the constitutional crisis caused by the presidential decision to hold a referendum at all costs, but did the honored lawyer of the Republic of Belarus corresponding member of the National Academy of Sciences of Belarus, one of the fathers of the Belarusian constitution, which he was supposed to guard, remember, did Valery Tikinia remember that he had no right to assume any obligations, on behalf of a collegiate body, what is the constitutional court, and what did his signature mean under the proposed compromise document? Compromise of a rabbit and a boa constrictor according to this document, each of the conflicting parties assumed certain obligations, the president agreed that any referendum decision would be advisory, not binding, 
Thus, with any outcome of the referendum, the Parliament received the respite. For this the Supreme Council refused the impeachment procedure, that is, as if writing off all the past scenes of the head of state 238. After that, the parties were to convene on a parity basis the Constitutional Assembly and amend the current Constitution. Seems like a compromise, it wasn't there, on an equal basis, is it 50 people from the President, 50 people from the Parliament, but after all, many deputies in Parliament actively support the President, which means that Lukashenko receives an inevitable majority in the Constitutional Assembly and therefore his amendments are still accepted, only a little later and already absolutely legitimately, the Supreme Council was offered only to postpone its own death for a while, one can imagine how the representatives of the Supreme Council felt when they had to sign this document, but they could not sign it. After all, it was they who invited representatives of the top Russian leadership here, who, by the way, did not understand anything about what was happening, but who received a clear order from Yeltsin to end the matter amicably, refusing now to sign such an amicable agreement, under which the president agreed to put his signature, meant for them to lose all support from Russia. Deputy Olga Bramova says, when Sharitsky entered the hall of the Supreme Council in the morning after a sleepless night, and we already knew what solution was proposed, I approached him and said that he simply betrayed all of us, that no one else would shake hands with him. Sharitsky, of course, exploded, but what could be changed here? Indeed, nothing could be changed. Moreover, not everyone condemned the behavior of the speaker. Sharitsky was not ready to take responsibility for making a decision recalls Deputy Valery Shchukin 239, and this is understandable. What can I blame Sharitsky for, if I was not ready for this either? Moreover, I had nothing to be afraid of, and Sharitsky was afraid for his life, and then, we all remembered the White House shot down by tanks and had no doubt that it would be the same here, well, not tanks, tanks, there may be no reason to withdraw here, but that blood would be shed, that Lukashenko would go to bloodshed, we were all sure of this, doubts and fears of parliamentarians are humanly understandable, a little more than a year has passed since deputies of the 12th convocation were beaten right in the meeting room, simply because they protested against an illegal, from their point of view, attempt to change state symbols, what should be expected now, when it was about the initiators of Lukashenko's impeachment, it is not difficult to believe in his willingness to go to any lengths, after all, the fear of impeachment made everything else insignificant for him, why did the Russians do this? This agreement was signed by Lukashenko and Sharitsky says Sergei Kalyakin. It was signed by Tikinia, which he absolutely could not do. He went beyond his competence, and it was signed by Chernomirdin, Strove and Seleznev. Moreover, they did not really want to sign, but they were asked the question. Well, we agreed, but who is the guarantor of these agreements? Who is responsible for the fact that tomorrow everyone will not call all this a silly letter? Chernomirdin's response sounded something like this. Great and fraternal Russia in the person of its top leaders will be the guarantor. We committed an act. We left the sick Yeltsin in Russia. It does not happen at all that all leaders fly to one state, to one place and the signatures of members the Supreme State Council of the Union State will guarantee the observance of these agreements, and Gennady Seleznev at a press conference almost literally repeated the words of the British Prime Minister Chamberlain, said by him after the Munich Agreement with Hitler, we brought peace, why did the Russians do this, 
Here is one of the versions. The main reason for the Russians was the fear of a repetition of the Moscow events of 1993 in Belarus 240, but there is another suggestion. They deliberately betrayed our Supreme Council. Well, they were not afraid that they would remain fools. No, they were afraid of something completely different. They were afraid of losing Lukashenko as a guarantor of their own interests. As we later found out to ourselves, some of them had shares in BMZ, some had the interests of Gazprom, etc. It was only later revealed, they needed Lukashenko 241. This version is still only a guess, which takes us far ahead, to the topic with which I hope to end this book. Mouse trap. Let's return to the Oval Hall to once again be convinced of the director's skill of our hero and his art of building intrigue. It is not easy to convey what actually happened at that moment in the Oval Hall. The Supreme Council resembled a tumbled beehive. Someone resented Sharitsky and Kalyakin. Someone cursed Lukashenko and the leader of the pro-presidential consent faction Vladimir Konoplev, unexpectedly for everyone, called on his colleagues in the faction not to vote for the ratification of the night agreement. Konoplev ran around the hall with a mobile phone, coordinated, commanded recalls Valery Shchukin. We sat there like sheep, Konoplev, no offense will be said to him, is also not a leader, if you can compare. He is like a gun commander, him, battery, to battle, he, weapon to battle, charge, charge, he is commanded by mobile phone, he duplicates, and that's it, here are its functions, like a gun commander, run and command, our faction leaders sit and wait, do not want to take responsibility, and the presidential ones receive the command that it would be better to disrupt the signing. We voted yes, but they were already in the majority. Vladimir Konoplev 242 and did not hide the fact that it was not he who gave the command to disrupt the ratification, but his master, Lukashenko. This was recorded by the journalists present in the hall. Konoplev brought the mobile phone to his ear, listened for a moment, went to the center and raised the phone above his head. Look, I'm not speaking on my own behalf, but on behalf of, battery, don't vote. It is not difficult to understand why Lukashenko gave such a command. Why should he bind himself to any obligations? But there are guarantors, there is an agreement with them. Lukashenko was not going to take responsibility to them for violating this word. It was much more profitable for him to blame it on parliament. And Lukashenko personally arrives at the Supreme Council and begins to persuade the deputies to ratify the signed agreement. And without adopting any additional documents, this was the trap that Sharitsky and Kalyakin fell into. By signing the night agreement, they assumed that in the morning they would be able to at least partially neutralize their loss by adopting an explanatory resolution on the procedure for convening the Constitutional Assembly, etc. Lukashenko immediately understood this and chose a simple tactic to persistently ask the parliament to ratify the agreement, knowing full well that without the adoption of additional documents, the deputies would not agree to this, the agreement will be frustrated, but frustrated not by him, but by their fault, it was also clear that neither Yeltsin nor his envoys would delve into any subtleties and would not even try to figure out who was actually disrupting the ratification. I think that now many of the deputies would behave differently Sergei Kalyakin believes, but then, Konoplev shouts from the podium, don't vote for this agreement, the president asks you, and even the opposition doesn't vote, although the opposition should seem to act the other way around, but even it votes the way Lukashenko needs, this is illogically simple, it's just illogical. But there was really nothing illogical there, and there was a cleverly constructed intrigue and a cunningly thought out problem.
Konoplev, as if on behalf of the bus, urges not to support the agreement, and those who are for the bus vote against. Lukashenko calls to support the agreement, and those who are against Lukashenko vote again against. And in this chaos, the leaders of the factions no longer control the situation. There is no one in the hall who, like Guncha, could clearly and harshly explain to the deputies what stupidity they are doing, not even stupidity, political suicide, after all, they were lured into a mouse trap, as a result, several votes were not enough for approval recalls Mikhail Pastakhov, after which Lukashenko said, well, since the Supreme Council did not approve the agreement, why should I agree with its terms? I don't fulfill my obligations either. The mouse trap door slammed shut. There was no longer a parliamentary majority, and there was no parliament. He ceased to exist at the moment when all hope of impeachment disappeared. The Constitutional Court surrenders the Constitution, Mikhail Pastakhov says, in the morning. When we came to the Constitutional Court to consider the case, all participants in the process had already gathered, many judges were wearing robes, Valerie Tikinia was late and came at 20 past 9, saying, we urgently need to hold a meeting, with inflamed eyes and, it is felt, tired, but we already knew that the night agreement had been signed, Tikinia introduced us to him. He said that they managed to avoid tragic consequences in our country, under the patronage of Russian officials, an agreement was concluded according to which Lukashenko would not insist on a mandatory referendum on the adoption of the Constitution, the deputies would withdraw their signatures, and the Constitutional Court in this case would stop this case, everything seems to be Chin China. But there was the only question that I asked Valery Gurevich, and who, in fact, authorized you to sign such an agreement from the Constitutional Court, we have to look into this matter, as a speaker, I was interested in seeing things through to the end, and I said that, regardless of any agreements, we should start a court session on this issue and find out whether the signing of a document on the settlement of the dispute is a basis for postponing the process, we will listen, they say, to the representatives of the Supreme Council, who initiated the process, and the representatives of the President, who came in full force, we will read this agreement, see how the parties react to it, and we will continue the process, Tikinia said, no, he did not agree and did not want to vote on my proposal, moreover, when I began to insist, he called an assistant and said, tell me that the trial is being postponed until two hours due to the fact that circumstances have changed. When the meeting ended, furious representatives of the Supreme Soviet burst into Tikina, they were deputies Dobrovolsky, Grushevsky and Shchukin. What? We do not revoke our signatures, you must consider the case. But Tikinia began to explain to them that this agreement made it possible to avoid bloodshed and get peace, if only bad, but peace and that Russian officials are guarantors that it will be possible to avoid a war between the President and the Supreme Soviet and resolve the conflict peacefully, by amending the Constitution through the Supreme Council, in general, the decision was not made even at 2 o'clock, since nothing had been received from the Supreme Council, but Tikinia called Sharitsky and said, where is your letter? Where is your letter that you are withdrawing signatures? The most interesting thing is that the letter from Sharitsky, where he proposed to close the case in the Constitutional Court due to the fact that a number of deputies refused their signatures, arrived at 5 o'clock. Tikinia immediately gathered us, but the six judges were adamant. Why should we drop the case? We have no reason for this, and on this day, it was not possible to stop the case, but the most important thing was lost, time, 
the fateful day of November 22 was lost, when the Constitutional Court had every opportunity, every reason to consider the issue within noon and issue a conclusion that the whole country was waiting for, what made Valery Tikinia give up, after all, he surrendered, despite the fact that there was already an unspoken agreement by a group of leaders of the Supreme Council, if impeachment passes, early elections will be called and deputies will nominate Tikin as a presidential candidate. The date. Many believed that such an agreement would inspire Tikkun and give determination to the chief judge of the state. For moral support, pickets were ready to be on duty at the building of the Constitutional Court day and night. Silence was scared. I was frightened, as I can imagine, precisely of the fact that people might come to the courthouse, most likely. His sad experience had an effect when he had to go through the living corridor of those who had gathered after the failure of the August Putsch on Independence Square, and when he, until recently, the powerful secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Belarus, walked along this corridor, and people didn't beat him, no, but it would be better to hit him, it would be easier, they spat at him and the BPF combatants, led by Vyacheslav Sivchik, dragged Tikhon, sick and broken by a heart attack, under his arms away from the angry crowd, and he only humbly and hastily muttered words of gratitude, without the people the Supreme Council, most likely, was also afraid of the human element, the deputies, like Tikinia, were not ready to appeal to the people, but Lukashenko was ready to appeal to the people at any moment, which, in fact, he did by holding a referendum, and there is no doubt that, at his call, crowds of people could indeed then take to the square, simply because almost no one understood what was being said, they did not read either the current constitution, or the constitution as amended by the president, which, by the way, was not even published in advance, or the constitution, which was submitted to a referendum as an alternative by the deputies, ordinary people did not care what was written in these constitutions and on whose side the truth was, they wanted one thing, to be allowed to live in peace, and all this quarrel at the very top, as they were explained, interfered with life, interfered with all these incomprehensible showdowns in the struggle for power, Lukashenko was closer, more understandable, simpler, and if he had called them, they would have followed him and personally defeated the Supreme Council, seeing in it a source of swarming 243, but it wasn't needed, the Supreme Council was already ready to surrender, the time for democracy and the market was ending, the era of autonomy had begun, Prime Minister Mikhail Chich also understood this and, without waiting for the referendum, he posed the question point blank, either the referendum is cancelled or I leave, the Minister of Labour Alexander Suznov recalls, I found out that Chich wrote a letter of resignation in the morning when he came to work, they ran to me with wide eyes, did you hear, hear, I hear, I called Chich, asking on the phone, truth, truth, can I come, come, I immediately came to him, he spoke so quietly, so quietly that it was not audible, everything was tapped, it turns out, he even wrote on paper who would leave with him, I told him that no one would leave except me, I guarantee, here I guarantee that no one but me, Suznov was right, he had a much longer political experience and understood that in such a situation, officials do not part with portfolios, especially collectively, after all, they did not support Viktor Guncher, although Suznov's opinion is not shared by all members of that government. When Chichra resigned, many of the ministers grumbled quietly why he didn't talk to them, and they would have left, and it is valid, the person 5-7 would leave, and so what it turns out, I took it and left, well, go away, to hell with you, if at least some force left to organize, otherwise he just slammed the door, 
244. Here Vasily Leonov is not quite accurate, Suznov continues. Chich held a meeting at which they allegedly agreed to leave together, but I was not at that meeting, no one invited me, or maybe it was the presidium of the cabinet of ministers that made such a decision in a narrow circle, but no matter who and what decision was made, only Chich and Suznov, who joined him, resigned anyway, however, Chich, as his colleagues slandered, would not have left if he had not found out that nothing could shine for him in the new composition of the government, which was supposed to be created after the referendum, and all these games were held in offices, away from real life and even from those who stood on those nights on the square in front of the government house, without those people for whom, in theory, politics should be done. The people were ready to support the parliament, they said, give us the right, we will go into the building of the government house says Valery Shchukin, but he seems to be wishful thinking, speakers advise Valentina Sviatskaya and journalist Lyudmila Maslyukova object to him, they were too few to appeal to them, it was not the people, but the Belarus and Popular Front Party. They brought people to the square, and Sharitsky shouted, let everyone go, he went out to the square and said, I ask you to disperse, and yet, there were people on the square in front of the government house, I saw them myself, they were on duty around the clock, replacing each other, it was cold, but they asked everyone who left the building the same question, won't the deputies surrender, will they survive? What could they answer? One of the women explained, You see, I have three children, I want them to grow up in a democratic country, I don't want them to live in fear like my parents. I understand well what she meant, when, after all the crazy vigils in parliament, I told my mother about what was happening, she said, Hush, close the door. She behaved in exactly the same way at the end of the Brezhnev and Drop of Era, when I, a student, and then a school teacher, allowed myself to criticize the government allowed at home. Now, in 1996, her fear returned, not for herself, but for me. She was afraid, just as this young woman on Independence Square was afraid for her still small children, but these were few, and no one heard them, and the masses obediently, obeying Lukashenko's call, went to vote. They poured them into the polling stations, believing that life would become even better, or at least it won't get worse. The referendum was already in full swing when Sharitsky decided to sign the impeachment himself. He called a press conference to announce it. Columnist for the newspaper Fimas Yuri Toporashev asked with bewilderment, but why didn't you sign for impeachment sooner? Do you really not understand? Sharitsky was indignant. Yes, if I had done this, we would not have been here, meaning the government house, yesterday, and heard in response, but you won't be here tomorrow, they were not there the next day, there was no parliament, there was no constitution, there was nothing to protect, this is where we ended, the results of the November 24 referendum are known. The chairman of the Central Election Commission, Lydia Yermoshina, announced with sincere and unconcealed satisfaction that the president had won. Tikinia scheduled a session of the Constitutional Court to consider the issue of impeachment for Tuesday, November 26, says Mikhail Pastokhov. On Monday, the Central Election Commission summed up the results. On Tuesday a meeting of deputies who supported the president was held, I think they got together at 9 o'clock, because Tahini's assistant slipped under our door when we were deliberating, a two-point bill to dismiss the impeachment case in the Constitutional Court, the law was signed by Alexander Lukashenko, probably, like Yermoshina, with undisguised satisfaction. It was clear that the current constitutional court ceased to exist, and the judges had to leave. The question was how to leave, 
recognizing the legality of the illegal referendum, or not recognizing, to whom to write a letter of resignation, to the Supreme Council, according to the legal constitution, or to the President, agreeing with the illegal constitution, Mikhail Pastokhov continues, the next day, I learned that someone from the administration suggested writing a letter of resignation addressed to the President, and he would satisfy it, a resignation decree with all guarantees is already being prepared in the presidential administration, guarantees for retiring judges were very significant, 75% of earnings, various benefits, etc., and such a decree seemed to be being prepared, moreover, on the same days, the deputy chairman of the constitutional court, Valerie Fadiv, was summoned to the administration to coordinate this decree, therefore, some of the judges wrote a statement addressed to the president, on December 2, I wrote a statement addressed to the chairman of the Supreme Council Sharitsky that I do not consider it possible to act as a judge of the constitutional court in conditions when a new version of the constitution was illegally put into effect. The same statement was written by Valery Tikinia and Judge Alexander Vashkovich, but Tikinia took one more step, which no one expected from him, perhaps, remembering his age, that, according to the law, he was entitled to a lifelong security in the amount of 75% of his official salary, he asked for resignation not only to the not abolished presidium of the Supreme Council, but also to the president, that is, he acted in accordance with the new version of the constitution, this seemingly trifle finally marked the victory of Lukashenko, who simply needed the lawyer Tikhon to show obedience and humility, silence was lowered, I was very surprised to learn that Valery Gurevich wrote a new statement says Mikhail Pastokhov, already in the name of the president, and the first, as far as I know, was resigned and was relieved of his post, and immediately Judge Grigory Vasilevich was appointed acting chairman of the Constitutional Court, thus, the body that was supposed to guard the first constitution of the sovereign Belarusian state actually self-liquidated, at the same time, as we see, the issue of guarantees of material well-being played an important role, Lukashenko always knew how important it was that material well-being should worry any official more than the fate of the constitution and all sorts of freedoms. The referendum drew a line under the existence of the Supreme Council as a full-fledged body of state power. Sergei Kalyakin recalls, in the morning after the referendum, we were simply not allowed into the building of the government house, it was possible, of course, to break through with fists, but it would not have given anything anyway, parliamentarians are not militants, their weapons are completely different, legitimacy, persuasion, then, of course, the deputies were allowed to take their personal belongings, they were a pitiful sight as they left the building of the defeated Supreme Soviet, they took away blankets and heaters, prepared in case of defense of the parliament that was not stormed by anyone, they took with them thick reference books, from which they scooped the wording of amendments to bills, retired, adjusting his glasses, Stanislav Bogdankovich with a briefcase, which contained his unclaimed proposals to the tax code, he left, scolding the losing leadership of the parliament, the failed Belarus and Havel, Stanislav Shashkovich, the deputies split, some of the deputies simply left politics, to nowhere, some remain faithful to the 1994 constitution and announced that they did not recognize the results of the referendum, gathered together, these deputies were delighted to find that among them were the majority of the members of the presidium of the Supreme Soviet, and they announced that the Supreme Council continues to work, despite the fact that the quorum is not enough, 
as if that was the issue, the remaining 110 deputies Alexander Lukashenko, by his decree, introduced into the composition of the House of Representatives formed in accordance with the new constitution. This does not mean that only people without conscience entered the chamber, many, they say, were tormented by doubts, Lyudmila Maslyukova says, in the morning, the first meeting of the House of Representatives established after the referendum was to take place, and yet, as if the doors were open, you can still either join there, or stay with the oppositionists, one of the deputies, an elderly man, lived in the Minsk hotel, and in the middle of the night it picks up, again this question, where, there or here, the chairman of the collective farm, the nomenclature, the kami, here, there, falls asleep again, all alarmed, with a stone in his heart, and suddenly, at a certain moment, he discovers that he is stomping along Skorin Avenue in the direction of the former building of the Central Committee of the Komsomol, where they were supposed to hold their first meeting, it scratches along the avenue, and without pants, suddenly he stops, where am I, why, why am I not dressed, and ran back to the hotel, that's how the choice was made for him, in a semi-delirium, this is how the choice was made for many people's deputies who surrendered the people along with the constitution, chapter 4, who is guilty, don't worry about Lukashenko, Lukashenko won, this victory was a turning point not only in his personal destiny, but also in the history of our entire state, we saw how it happened, now it remains to understand why this happened, it would be easiest to say today, Valery Tikinia is guilty, or, Samyan Sharitsky is guilty, but it is much more important to comprehend what happened without reducing the national tragedy, which was the referendum, to personalities, so, could the 1996 crisis have been averted, probably not, it was about more than a quarrel between the deputies and Alexander Lukashenko, it was not about who would prevail, but about choosing a path, either the supremacy of the law will be established in our country, and this will be recognized by all subjects of the political process, or one of the subjects of this process will be able to rule autocratically, shift the boundaries outlined by the law and expand them at its own discretion, how the genie Hotabich in the children's fairy tale of the Soviet times moved apart and moved the gates of the chisel team, playing along with their rivals from the puck team, until no one could tell what the score was in a football match, we do not know what would have happened to the country if the Supreme Soviet had won the referendum, supporters of the president believe that it would be much worse, true, the president's opponents still maintain that things can't get any worse, because Belarus is perhaps the only country in the world that claims to be civilized, where the autocratic decisions of the head of state, decrees and decrees, acquire a higher force than the law, and the entire pyramid of state power, all civil servants, no matter what position they hold, even realizing the inconsistency of such a state structure are subject to these decisions. Why did it happen so, Olga Bramova, with the compassion inherent in women, is ready to share the responsibility for what happened, we, the deputies, it doesn't matter that we were provoked, as they say, they provoke you, but don't be provoked, we were the first to allow ourselves to violate the constitution, if the president made a proposal to amend the constitution, then we were obliged to urgently consider this proposal, we refused it, they said that the proposal is illegal and we will not consider it, this is our prerogative, and thus violated the procedure, but this was not a technical violation, the procedure is spelled out constitutionally, 
it was this violation of ours that provoked Lukashenko to take decisive action, obvious logical inconsistency, the defiant behavior of the Supreme Council did not provoke Lukashenko's intentions, but only untied his hands in the implementation of his far-reaching intentions. Yes, the 1994 Constitution was far from legislative perfection, it did not clearly spell out presidential prerogatives. On the other hand, the powers of the Supreme Council were not clearly spelled out and looked somewhat unbalanced. For example, the Constitution contained norms that allowed the Parliament to express no confidence in the government, impeach the President, and dissolve local councils of deputies, but the Supreme Council itself was, as it were, out of control, it was not subject to dissolution, it appointed elections for itself, and when some of the deputies stopped going to meetings, as was the case in the last six months of the Supreme Soviet of the Twelfth Convocation, the country generally found itself without legislative power, despite the fact that the deputies were not subject to recall, and the deputies behaved not quite constitutionally, one of the authors of the 1994 Constitution, now the chairman of the Constitutional Court of the Republic of Belarus, Professor Grigory Vasilevich complained, it has become almost a good form rule not to even consider drafts submitted by the President as a legislative initiative 245, let us leave the question of how democratic the bills proposed by the President were, from the point of view of the procedure, Grigory Vasilevich and Olga Bramova are undoubtedly right, acting solely according to the law. Lukashenko could not do anything with the parliamentarians who boycotted his initiatives, both the failure of the 1994 constitution and the incorrectness of the deputy's attitude towards Lukashenko are obvious, it is also clear that the situation needed to be corrected, of course, not in the way that Lukashenko chose for this. Ally Oksandr Lukashenko has repeatedly said that the 1994 constitution was written under another, indeed, the parliamentary majority of the Supreme Soviet of the Twelfth Convocation frankly created it under Kabich, there is no doubt that Kabich would have had enough of the powers prescribed in it, he would have been able to dispose of them without a war with Parliament, and the Parliament would not fight with the President, who is traditionally ready for a compromise, especially since the parliamentary majority perceived Kabich as their own serving person who rose to the presidency, and Lukashenko was considered and is considered an upstart, a random person 246, even now there are politicians forecasting its imminent fall 247, but Lukashenko is not cabbage, he came for power, and complete, therefore, he was not interested in cosmetic amendments, but in a fundamental change in the constitution, he never hid his intentions, he immediately warned, don't worry about Lukashenko, Lukashenko will rule for 12 years, and as you can see, he did not lie, this is despite the fact that the 1994 constitution provided for two terms of five years each, and no more 248 success in the economy, against the economy, however, Lukashenko won the referendum not only thanks to administrative resources and obvious manipulations, his victory is connected primarily with the economic situation in Belarus. Let's listen to what Prime Minister Mikhail Chichur says at the All Belarus and People's Assembly. The implementation of the targets for socio-economic development for 1996, 
made it possible in nine months to ensure an increase in the volume of gross domestic product by 1%, an increase in industrial production by 2.6%, the volume of agricultural production for nine months amounted to 101.8% of the level of the corresponding period last year, exports increased by 17.5%, the consumer price index fell from 5.6% in January to 1.8% in September, the commissioning of residential buildings has increased by 65% in nine months to 149 of course, she directed as Prime Minister and, naturally, tried to present the work of the government he had it in the most favorable light possible, in addition, he still naively believed that a referendum could be avoided if the president was convinced that he was simply not needed, why is there a political crisis, if the economy is developing at the very least, even if it is small? But the growth of the main indicators is obvious, the standard of living of voters is at least somehow growing, by the way, 1996 becomes the year of maximum employment of workers in the construction industry, which means that people have money to buy apartments, why risk this imaging prosperity, after all, it is possible to continue peacefully without squabbles and confrontation, to build our own small sovereign state together, of course, for the sake of the bad, but the world Chichra could slightly embellish the picture, but in order to believe him, you need to see what actually happened in the economy of Belarus during this period, our economy is closely connected with the Russian one, this is a well-known fact, she was connected so closely that this connection can be compared with the umbilical cord that connects the baby to the mother's body. The August coup of 1991 acted as a midwife, but the midwife forgot to cut the umbilical cord. The child grew up as if separately, but the mother's body continued to supply everything necessary. The first two years in Russia were extremely difficult. However, already in 1994-1995, the reforms of the Russian economy, pushed through by the hard hand of Boris Yeltsin, began to give the first results, the Russian currency began to strengthen, the Russian market turned out to be solvent, cheap and quite competitive Belarus and goods again found their bias, moreover, Russia and Belarus have agreed to create a common customs space and even symbolically demolished border posts on the state border. In addition, Russia generously wrote off to the young president all the debts left from the previous government and continued to supply energy at domestic Russian prices. But the growth of the economy was caused not only by the favor of Russia towards the Belarusians, the results of those uncertain, but still market-oriented reforms that the government of Vyacheslav Kabich carried out in the last year of its existence also made themselves felt. He signed a number of government decrees that unleashed the hands of businessmen. In the first year and a half of his reign, Alexander Lukashenko not only did not cancel these decisions, but also allowed the leaders of the economic bloc of the government to follow the same course. Two and a half years was enough for the economy to slowly begin to recover and the first composition of Lukashenko's government was still focused precisely on transformations, the program of priority measures to improve the economy was not only adopted, but also carried out, and certain positive shifts in the economy were outlined, until Lukashenko realized that the freedom of market relations would limit his intervention in the economy, he sincerely supported these transformations, therefore, both the state apparatus and part of the active voters wanted a referendum because they hoped that the reforms would continue, 
and prosperity would grow, this means that Mikhail Chichar, who ardently advocated the rejection of the referendum, ensured its success with all his activities as Prime Minister, and then Lukashenko took advantage of the labors of marketers to destroy the prospect of market reforms for many years to come. However, he always knew how to use it and throw it away as unnecessary. Disobedience is punishable. One of the most weighty weights on the referendum ball was the fact that the Belarus and political elite of the pre Lukashenko generation never had the feeling that it was an elite. Everyone is used to the fact that they are just cocks, that nothing depends on them, the decision is always made by someone else. Here, in this referendum, everything was rude, primitive, with a stake on political squalor Stanislav Shashkovich believes. Here, they say, we will impose such a system that this enlightened sheep deserves. I will show them who is capable of ruling here, Lukashenko showed, and he put the enlightened sheep in its proper place, appropriate in the opinion of the winner. The decision is made only by him and all the rest are servants, on which only the degree of accuracy in the execution of the order depends, so, in fact, nothing depends, but if nothing depends on you, then it means that you are not responsible for anything, it was a state of collective irresponsibility of the entire state apparatus, when even those managers who were aware of what was happening, still reassure themselves, it's not me who will have to answer anyway, after all, I didn't make that damn decision about the referendum, I am not a politician, but just a civil servant 250, in 1996, Alexander Lukashenko took full advantage of the mass fear of officials to lose their jobs, he knew exactly what he was doing, he put himself in their place, realizing that the mentality had not changed since the days of the Soviet Union, when disobedience was always punished more than even a direct violation of the law, he knew how all these people weigh their own future, from the collective farm foreman to the governor and minister, after all, everything is clear with the Supreme Council, most likely, Lukashenko will slam his Lukashenko, as Yeltsin slammed in Russia, and the president, he will remain, even if he suddenly loses the referendum, after all, there may not be an impeachment, moreover, Lukashenko also has popular support, how can you go against the people, sole defender and they went for Lukashenko and for the people, as if not realizing that they were going against democracy, against democracy as the principle of exercising their powers by the people, they allegedly went according to the will of the people, but thinking not at all about the people, but only about their own personal fate, not looking too far into it both officials and deputies, of course, saw that everything in the history of the referendum was wrong, undemocratic, and did not comply with the constitution, but they were too weak internally, it was Lukashenko who acted resolutely, without breaks, and they were afraid even in their thoughts to deviate from the rules, to leave the constitutional field, so that, God forbid, don't give yourself a reason to accuse yourself of abuse of power, and most importantly, they were afraid to appeal to the people, they were afraid to go out into the square, and since they no longer had any mass media, they willingly shifted the responsibility to the voters, relying on the notorious folk wisdom, like, our wise people will understand everything, but the people lived well, according to their concepts, and did not even understand, and did not want to understand, because of what all this fuss was about, wages and pensions were paid on time and in full, and even grew little by little, if this was a dictatorship, then it did not interfere with life, somehow feed the family, work, the people were diligently rooted in the belief that everything that was happening at the top was just a showdown for the sake of power, they were unable to share something there, 
and they were preventing our Lukashenko from defending his people. Chapter 5 Under this world you should not bend enemies all around the remnants of the deputies of the 13th Convocation managed to achieve victory in only one thing. They really notified all international organizations about the illegality of the decision taken at the referendum to change the Belarusian constitution and extend the powers of Alexander Lukashenko for two years, thanks to a full-fledged surveillance system created with the support of parties and public organizations by a handful of enthusiasts led by Belarusian popular front activists Vladimir Antsilevich. Verochiko and Viktor Ivashkovich, they managed to prove to the whole world that there were massive violations of the law, the Supreme Council failed to even pay the participants of the observation gasoline in order to bring copies of the protocols on numerous violations to Minsk, nevertheless, the protocols were brought and already in the middle of the day in the building of the government house, journalists and diplomats were told about several thousand violations committed during voting and counting of votes 251. The whole world, except Russia, did not recognize the results of the referendum. Russia, on the other hand, did not go into details, but only waved its hand complacently. There were no shots, no tanks on the streets, no impeachment, well, that's nice, in the beginning, Strove still somehow communicated with Sharitsky recalls Valentina Sviatskaya, and Sharitsky once tried to tell him on the phone, well, how did you get through, Strove tried to explain, yes, we did not expect that Lukashenko would turn out to be such a dishonorable person. And then Strove simply stopped answering calls, either he was busy, then something else, and Sharitsky stopped calling him, apparently, chairman of the Federation Council Yeager Strove did not even think that such behavior could be called a betrayal, the usual political expediency, it is always wiser to communicate with the winners. This is how Russian leaders assume political responsibility for everything they help their strategic partner, the role that Lukashenko played and continues to play, although now not always successfully, Russia finally sobered up and began to calculate how much it costs her such a strategic partnership, but we will definitely return to the analysis of the reasons for such behavior of the owners of the Kremlin and, in general, to the history of our heroes' relations with Russia at the end of the book. And now let's see how Lukashenko's relationship with what is commonly called the international community developed. The most surprising thing is that it is exactly the same as with the internal enemy. The reason for this was, the West did not recognize the results of the referendum announced by Lydia Yermoshina and forever took pride of place in the list of Lukashenko's main enemies. Now Lukashenko had no choice but to try to lower this enemy as well, to demonstrate his complete failure in trying to influence the head of the Belarusian state. However, Lukashenko began to demonstrate his temper and provoke a quarrel long before the referendum, as if foreseeing everything in advance. The whole world was shocked by the news about the balloon with two American pensioners destroyed in the Belarusian airspace. The unfortunate ones went off course during international competitions. It cost nothing to force the pilots to land without destroying the balloon, and there was no point in this destruction, except for one thing. Lukashenko's unwillingness to reckon with generally accepted rules and intentions to loudly declare this, moreover, as the newspapers later reported, all commanders who made the decision to destroy the balloon receive gratitude from Lukashenko, and the direct executor of the order receives a personal award in the form of a wristwatch, maybe he'll understand, 
but the complacent West failed to understand that the downed balloon was not an accident. In 1996, even before the announcement of the referendum, the West made an attempt to agree with Lukashenko on the rules of conducting a common European home. For negotiations, it was decided to invite Lukashenko to France on an official visit and French President Jacques Chirac played the role of negotiator. This visit has long been insistently demanded by the Belarusian side. The decision to hold it was taken without enthusiasm as a result of numerous consultations in Paris 252. I well remember the conversation with Ambassador Claude Joliffe, who informed me of the possibility of such a visit. What do you think? Joliffe asked, will this visit be fruitful? I mean that President Chirac will try to explain to President Lukashenko what Europe expects from him, maybe he will understand, I think you are mistaken, Mr. Ambassador, you don't have to be a prophet to understand, Lukashenko only learns what he wants to learn, unfortunately, I turned out to be right. What the excessively naive French had to be convinced of, the visit was decent enough, including at the highest level, despite the fact that there were rather exchanges of monologues, especially from the Belarusian side, than a real dialogue, after the Belarusian president had fun on the Picardy farm. He looks pleased with his trip and confidently reports that the French constitution inspired him to reform his own. 253. The main discovery that Lukashenko made during his official visit to France is that, according to the French constitution, the president is elected for seven years, and one of the arguments in favor of the 1996 referendum was the need to bring the basic law of Belarus closer to European standards. Is it worth being surprised after that by the indignation with which the grateful student perceived the dissatisfaction of his teachers with everything that was happening in Belarus? After all, he sincerely wanted to learn what he considered the best and worthy of attention, and when the teachers began to express dissatisfaction with the results of the lessons he had learned, he chose to leave the class with a scandal, where are they going? The country, as follows from the numerous statements of Lukashenko, is a kind of closed space, which is constantly threatened by something or someone, everything that wanders, crawls, flies into it from the outside, without personal agreement with the head of state who controls this space is an enemy 254, and if it does fly in, do with it, as it should be with the enemy, destroy it put it on its knees, lower it, and the same should be done with everyone who does not recognize him, Lukashenko, the authorities or does not agree with the orders established by him, Lukashenko could not punish the entire West for rejecting the results of the referendum, but it was possible to lower the plenipotentiaries of the Western states, you do not want to support me, so I will teach you a lesson. And so, Deputy Foreign Minister of Belarus Nikolai Bso told representatives of a number of embassies, USA, Lithuania, France, Poland, Germany, that they should immediately vacate their country residences in the village of Drozdy near Minsk 255. They tried to convince the diplomats that the sewerage system in the village was to be repaired, that all this was nothing more than temporary inconvenience. The ambassadors agreed to endure the inconvenience, since the residences were leased for a long time, and the place was very convenient, in the forest zone, but also five minutes from the center of Minsk. Although everyone understood that it was not a sewer at all, at first the conflict proceeded sluggishly, there was a struggle for endurance, who will lose their nerves first, it was possible to engage in such a tug of war for a long time, but this did not suit Alexander Lukashenko, the gates to the US ambassador's residence were sealed, 
the access roads were dug up, water, electricity and telephone communications were cut off, and the next day, the ambassadors of Germany, Great Britain, France and Italy, on behalf of all the countries of the European Union, notified the Belarusian authorities of their intention to leave Belarus for an indefinite period, the United States, Lithuania, Latvia, Poland joined their Denmark, the crisis, unprecedented in world diplomatic practice, lasted half a year until the Western powers realized the senselessness of confrontation and agreed with the demand of the Belarusian side to release Drozdy. However, only on condition of equivalent compensation, the American ambassador Daniel Spack had lasted the longest time in voluntary exile, but in the end he returned to Minsk. None of the Belarusian officials gave any reasonable explanation for what happened. In speeches by Alexander Lukashenko, at various times, there were hints that Western diplomats used their proximity to his summer residence for intelligence purposes. There is no doubt that the reasons for what happened are purely psychological. Lukashenko who compares leaders at various levels with peaks grunting and pushing at the trough of power, cannot afford lousy diplomacy and achieves his goal. Diplomats are still convinced that Lukashenko simply chose the most boorish way to demonstrate his coolness to the whole world, and after all, demonstrated, they are all back, so cute. Here is how the writer Yevgeny Budinus comments on this situation who, according to the repeated assurances of Minister Antonovich, has earned the right to be considered an honorary diplomat of Belarus 256, reassuring the public about the departure of diplomats, which threatened to break off diplomatic relations with almost the entire civilized world, Lukashen Cassette, where will they go, big salaries, they will return. Thus, he demonstrated his usual everyday logic and knowledge of the everyday psychology of not only the Belarusian people, not only his own sycophant officials who are always ready to bend for the sake of benefits and salaries, but also the mentality of Western officials, who are not painfully inferior to ours in these indicators, they did come back and more than once I had to listen to their lamentations about the benefits that were mediocrely lost due to such an absurdly shortened cadence. After all, he is the ambassador here, with all the servants, security, honor, and there he is an ordinary employee, forced to take the subway to work. Lukashen Kawan, more scandal, less scandal, but this was not the end of the matter. The best defense is an offensive. Such a shameful and petty scandal should be raised to the level of a scandal of principle, and in the midst of the conflict, Lukashenko goes to the economic forum in Kranz Montano, and with a mindset for a grandiose scandal, the audience was notoriously hostile, but Lukashenko calmly endures that he, the president of a European country, is called a dictator to his face. He is even pleased, because this insult comes in handy, this is an excellent occasion to turn not so much to the West, but to his own subjects, authoritatively, an international tribune, after all, express your version of what is happening, the residence of the embassy is the territory of the country that the ambassador represents, she is inviolable. We have never violated these civilized norms and will not violate them, and the fact that you are being misled here as if we seize the territory of the embassies is an ordinary lie, we are talking about temporary housing, about the mansions and cottages in which the ambassadors who left for consultations lived, you are committed to the inviolability of property, so, their lease term has long expired, except for the representations of two states, Russia and the United States, therefore, the diplomats of these two states have the right to stay in Drozdy, all the rest will move to new comfortable housing, 
which was built at their own request in the most fashionable district of Minsk 257 no lease term has expired, so it is clear to knowledgeable people that President Lukashenko is simply lying, it is impossible to assume that all these, to put it mildly, inaccuracies were from ignorance, after all, Lukashenko knew what he would be asked during a press conference, and, having accused Western journalists and forum organizers of bias and double standards in relation to Belarus, he deliberately went to the scandal, it is no coincidence that during a press conference held in a tough form, he defiantly left the hall, and then left ahead of schedule for Minsk. Now any sanctions that Europe may impose against Belarus will not be interpreted as a reaction to the violation of the Vienna Convention by the Belarusian authorities, but as revenge for the principled position of the president in Kranz Montano. After all, what matters to Lukashenko is not what the West thinks, but what his electorate says somewhere in Pukhovici or Glubako, what is ours, not shy, how he famously finished them, didn't submit, voters from Pukhovici and Hliboka, who are not burdened by the knowledge of diplomatic conventions, perceive Lukashenko's rudeness as something natural, don't want to recognize us, and we face you in the dirt, won't you let us in, and it hurts we need it, thus began the personal isolation in which Alexander Lukashenko found himself after the 1996 referendum, but Lukashenko fully implemented the principle of Louis Ziv, the state is me, and the personal isolation of the president turned into the fact that the whole republic found itself in international isolation, it is not recognized in Europe, and in the world only a few dictatorial regimes decided to make friends with it. 258, the most striking manifestation of isolation was the free time decision of the European Union to restrict entry into the EU territory of high-ranking officials of the Belarusian state. 259, the West had only one hope, Lukashenko is temporary. After all, all presidents come and go, at the end of their terms, hope was, frankly, weak, accustomed to certain rules of the game, Western politicians had little idea who they were dealing with, Lukashenko did not fit into any usual framework, at some point, he stated, it happened, today Lukashenko was elected president in Belarus, he was endowed with power and demanded the highest responsibility for literally everything, but will it ever end, you know 260, whether his listeners understood this is unknown, but he himself suddenly understood and was horrified, yes, Lukashenko has achieved immeasurable power, but not infinite, he did not foresee this when he redrawn the constitution. Then, in 1996, he thought 12 years was a lot, and it turned out, not enough, it turned out that it is not even the entire constitution that prevents him from making his power infinite now, but only one line in it, no more than two terms, and of the first book, Youth Jokes, Generalissimo, Book 2, Third Term Part I, the house that he built himself as soon as I parted ways with the presidential administration, I became a columnist for the opposition Belruskaya Delova Gazeta, that is, I joined the critics of Lukashenko's policy, or rather, as it turned out, I was in this camp, while still working in the administration and it's not at all because at that time I was trying to somehow harm Lukashenko and acted against him, it's just that my ideas about the politics of power differed markedly from what the highest bearer did, need to work, that's what Sinitsin said every time I reported to him about another misfortune that fell on our heads after a new presidential improvisation, we are working, Leonid Georgievich, you're doing a bad job, what do you mean, but, you don't work the way you should, 
So how should it be? This Sinitsin, it seems, did not know himself. Interviews and speeches were being prepared. Information on the most important issues was regularly put on the table of both Lukashenko himself and the entire leadership of the administration. Seven people, including technical staff, the entire staff of our management, plowed around the clock. What claims, understand, you are responsible for civil society, where is his support, strange as it may seem, work was proceeding in this direction, and without any prodding from Sinitsin, chairman of the Belarusian Union of Military Personnel Nikolai Statkovich asked for a meeting 261 will Lukashenko surrender sovereignty, no I replied without hesitation then we will support him. However, other representatives of the democratic camp were in no hurry to assist the young head of state. I called the chairman of the United Democratic Party of Belarus Alexander Dobrovolsky myself to arrange a meeting. Come to our office Dobrovolsky answered and gave the address. I arrived at the agreed time, as it turned out, at a meeting of some elected body of the ADB. The cautious Dobrovolsky decided to play it safe and not conduct any negotiations behind the scenes. With the conscientiousness of a former school teacher, I blurted out a prepared tirade about the need for cooperation, about how the new government needs the intellectual support of the Democrats. They listened to me skeptically. Dobrovolsky thanked me and promised, after consulting with his party comrades, to call. That was it. The new administration had nothing to offer the parties and the public, because it itself did not quite clearly imagine what it wanted. Reforms without democracy can only be carried out by relying on force, but if this is how you want to govern, then what does all this chatter have to do with it? Civil society, public opinion, support. Take the tanks to the street like Pinochet and reform the economy, skilled in politics, Sinitsin could not but understand this, but he had to work out the number, he could not admit either to me or to himself that the building of the state ruled by Lukashenko G262, need to work, you're doing a bad job, Alexander Yosefovich, how should you work, think, they put you, you think, need a concept. I came up with it, he even called it the concept of acceptable criticism, it was possible to criticize the authorities, according to this concept, but only to a certain limit, and constructively, I even figured out how to teach this to the non-state press, at least one newspaper should have published sharp, but not overstepping the boundaries of what is permitted articles hints, criticizing the government and, as it were, suggesting a constructive attitude to the interpretation of its decisions. The Belruskaya de Lova Gazeta, which was just gaining authority, could become such a newspaper. The best journalists collaborated in it. Yuri Draka crossed, Roman Yakovlevsky, Alexander Sterikovich, the sharp, but quite adequate position of the newspaper testified that the BDG was quite suitable for the role destined for it. The publisher of BDG Pater Martsev suggested to me when we met, why don't you try to write something like that yourself? After all, you and I are both, it seems, philologists 263, already my first article, published under the pseudonym M, Z H, was discussed with fury in the Supreme Council, because, gently scolding Lukashenko in it, I rolled on the parliament, of course, the closet sound of my pseudonym caused a special fury, Sinitsin immediately called, listen, what kind of scribbler did he show up there? I went in and explained everything honestly. Look, Faduta, you finish the game. Sinitsin clearly did not intend to be accomplices in my project. Old man has already given the order to find out who was so brave there. Father I will explain, Leonid Georgievich. The next day I reported to Lukashenko on the work of the administration. He also reported on his concept, 
He kept silent only about his authorship, I see, Lukashenko portrayed complete benevolence, as always, when he had already made the decision and put an end to a person, let's see what happens, two weeks later, when Viktor Guncha resigned from his post on a grand scale, the concept, it seemed to me, worked, the commentary said that the potter had committed a stupidity, worse, a mistake, that he had to work helping the president, for the sake of reforms, for the sake of democracy and economic development, following the BDG, almost the entire non-state press condemned Hunch's resignation, as if on command, which I proudly reported to Lukashenko, again, without saying a word about his authorship, as I now understand, he already knew who the author was, and he was waiting for recognition from me, but I was an inexperienced official who dreamed of politics and my independent role in it, at least about independent work on your site, it seemed to me that we are all doing a common thing, we direct the state on the course of democracy and should trust each other, rejoicing in the diversity of assessments and judgments, pluralism of opinions and freedom of expression, and Martsev, and all the journalists with whom I spoke, saw their task in this, and Lukashenko seemed to us at first to be quite a promising guarantor of the democratic development of the country, after all, he came to power from the opposition and should be interested in supporting new ideas in society, in increasing the number of his political associates, now, Ten years later, I see all the naivety and groundlessness of these expectations, I understood this before seeing it seen only because, on duty, I tumbled in the superstructure, I oversaw ideology, we sincerely intended to build a new building, and seen it seen, and Matsev, and officials, and journalists, all together, although in different ways, and together they invented what it should be, but we were not needed, there was already an architect in this state, and, unlike us, he had already decided on its design, chapter first, with the best of intentions why is power needed, the referendum and the constitutional reform of 1996 legally provided the opportunity to build a state according to Lukashenko, under the constitution, adopted by the majority of the population, he received full power, now he could implement everything that was planned, but what was the intention, was there an intention, did our hero know why he needed power, were there any intentions based on him, Lukashenko, his own ideas about what is good and what is bad, Leonid Sinitsin testifies, was there an initial understanding of what we wanted from the government, in the beginning, there was only a clear knowledge that power had to be taken, that it was ownerless, there was a feeling of some kind of destiny and a clear understanding of how to make a revolution, it really was a revolution, after all, in reality, power was taken by a very small group of people, the fingers of one hand would be enough to count them, the most difficult thing is the morning after the victory, it was then, apparently, that some understanding woke up, Sinitsin is echoed by Peter Krovkenko, Lukashenko has never had any clear, coherent ideas about the model of the state, about the vector of development, he is a natural intuitionist, intuitively grasps ideas that are heard and popular with the people, as a politician, he was not born on the platform of the Supreme Council, although this is often said, as a politician, he was born in a Shplov bathhouse, where, naked, with a basin, he listened to half-drunk men who cut the truth womb, and received the necessary charge of information about how people live, what they are dissatisfied with, and after that, he went to the podium of the parliament and cut this bathhouse truth womb to the parquet politicians of Minsk and Moscow, he said what people wanted to hear, he remained the same intuitive populist when he became president, we have already spoken about the eclecticism of his economic outlook, 
he sincerely did not perceive market ideas, as a man through and through Soviet, back in Brezhnev's time, the closest thing to him, of course, was socialism with the human face, what are the features of this socio-political structure, first of all, this is the observance of the Soviet minimum standards in the field of social guarantees, we have introduced social standards, what is it? We have introduced a bar at the level of Soviet times, that we will do everything at the expense of the budget, as you say, for free 264, Lukashenko summed up his social policy in exactly five words, the people need a cup and a crackling, die, it's better not to say 265 using the old Belarusian proverb about a cup with crackling, he did not mean, of course, that the diet of Belarusians would be limited to this only, but he undertook to provide the basis of well-being. In his understanding, Belarusians will not eat richly, but satisfyingly 266. To do this, it is necessary to provide every Belarusian with a job paid, albeit at a minimum, but regularly. Those who today want to work, can work strive for this, feed their families, provide for themselves, they have a permanent place of work in our country, when a person knows that he will come to work every morning and receive a salary, but how do you, you see, in our country this problem has already been removed, although, of course, the wages of certain categories of people want to be higher, but nevertheless, there is no such problem with wages that existed even three years ago in our country, thanks to the development of the economy 267, there is no need to earn a lot, the main thing is to receive it regularly, guaranteed, as in Soviet times, the support of ordinary people for such a policy is guaranteed, as for the Western level, when a specialist earns as much in an hour as he receives in a month from us, then you don't have to worry, Lukashenko understands well that someone else's wealth always arouses envy among those who are forced, and even used to live modestly, from the very beginning he was, and remains, the leader of the majority, for whom a stable minimum is the ideal of well-being, how to implement this Soviet leveling, even if little by little, but for everyone, and ensure a feeling of modest well-being, if in a small state with a backward economy there is no money for social programs, which in a developed society are usually designed to alleviate the problems of inequality, with the cup in general, everything is simple. Prices for vodka in Belarus are almost the lowest in the world, this does not impoverish the budget too much, it is replenished due to the amount of alcohol consumed, such a price policy and concern for the cheerful mood of the electorate led to the fact that in the past, 2003, a, f, year, almost 52 liters of alcohol were consumed for every inhabitant of Belarus, including old people and babies, 25 times higher than the recommended norm by doctors 268, and what about the skvarka, also not very difficult, by the way, and not new, to redistribute 269, take away from the rich, who have already earned something, and distribute to everyone, as long as there is no war any Belarus and businessman knows that the most terrible extortions from business are not extortions from racketeer gangsters and not bribes from racketeers officials, these are voluntary compulsory deductions that he is forced to make at the expense of social programs, for a children's Christmas tree, sewing, landscaping of the urban area, for asphalting the entrance to the local tax office or sports facilities, the size of the requisitions depends on the size of the business, a small entrepreneur will be forced to flood the ice rink in the city center, a large one, to re-equip the stadium, a very large one, to build an ice palace or stadium, 
a continuer of Soviet traditions, let us recall how the head of the Mogolev regional agricultural industry Yevsi Kornid helped the Gorodets state farm, Lukashenko, and before all large firms, even commercial banks, imposed patronage over lagging collective farms, demanded help from them, not only financial, but also physical up to the departure of all employees for harvesting. Now he has gone further, it was proposed not just to take neglected farms under one's guardianship, but to buy them out together with debts, and not one, but two or three burnt out collective farms, I impose the destroyed farms on Aquabella and other private traders and industrial enterprises, it is you who subtly say low income, there is no profitability there, it is with a minus, these are ruined enterprises, but people want to live there and get paid 270, and if people want good uncle should give them it to them no matter at whose expense, there is no question of how people want to work at the same time, and whether they want to work at all, his whole idea was to feed the people says Leonid Sinitsin, the people cannot and do not want to feed themselves, therefore, those who have earned are forced to feed, of course, on behalf of the president who performed the miracle, perhaps the most significant of the miracles accomplished in this way was the boom in housing construction, it was not Lukashenko's own idea, even during the election campaign it was proposed by Sinitsin as one of the skates on which it was possible to overtake Kabich and theoretically substantiated by Professor Peter Capichula, and they, in general, did not come up with anything new, but only generalized and adopted the well-known experience of Nikita Khrushchev. Housing was being built, in each collective farm, the head was responsible for the construction of his own hat, construction projects in lagging farms became a headache for the businessman guarding them, Belarus Bank, the largest bank in the country, was forced to give concessional loans for construction to young families, since the bank's financial stability was based on the deposits of the rich and the funds of strong enterprises, this was, in fact, also a redistribution, funds owned by some were transferred on preferential terms to others, not fair, but it is unfair only from the point of view of the rich and snickering bankers, and from the point of view of the good sovereign, which Lukashenko constantly feels himself to be, everyone should be either bad or good, but the same, better than him, no one knew when, from whom and what should be taken away, and to whom, to throw a hand out so that the people would be pleased with their ruler, the poor would understand who cares about them, and opponents who they are dealing with 271, in addition, Lukashenko redistributed the budget in favor of the elderly, pensioners, and it turned out to be an unnatural situation, the redistribution of wealth in favor of the past, not the future, pensioners support unemployed children 272, in the practice of redistribution, discounts are not given to anyone, not even to foreign investors trying to invest in the reconstruction of Belarus and enterprises. The most scandalous example is an attempt to force the Russian brewing company Baltica to finance the construction of another ice palace. Baltica refused, for which it lost the opportunity to get the Belarus and brewery Krinitsa. By the way, already having invested money, this is what a social justice program looks like, and, I must say, Lukashenko has achieved almost unconditional recognition of this program from the side of ordinary people. Belarus today is a country where no one dies of hunger, where everyone is provided with at least some kind of medical assistance. Here everyone is guaranteed a job, albeit not in their specialty, albeit with a minimum, but regular pay, even if it has nothing to do with the volume of production and the social need for its products. Fifteen years ago, MTZ produced 100,000 tractors a year, now production has decreased by almost five times, 
and the number of employees has hardly decreased. Of course, one cannot call tractor builders loafers, but there is hidden unemployment here. Moreover, the most prosperous Minsk tractor plant is far from the only example here. 273. There are no oligarchs and super rich people here, and if there are, then very few, and they do not flaunt their wealth, but there are almost no absolute beggars. In any case, they are not conspicuous, as they are at Moscow railway stations. The state determines and establishes the subsistence minimum. The state provides it. True, as Lukashenko himself admits, at the level of 1,990, last year, the pre-crisis level of 1,990 was exceeded 274 the most effective in terms of economic indicators of the Soviet era, in terms of industrial production, consumer goods, real money incomes of the population and other indicators 275, it would seem that in practice the social ideal, which has long been formed in the minds of the majority of Belarus and voters who vote for Lukashenko, is being realized, moreover, this ideal or, rather, idealized image of the country continues to be actively and persistently introduced by the mass media into the minds of citizens. Any comparison turns in favor of Belarus, because the local life is compared not with Germany or Belgium, but with Russia and Ukraine, and not even with real Russia and real Ukraine, where different people in different places live differently and with the picture that they see every day on TV, let's say, Russia appears as a country of constant hunger strikes, strikes, non-payment of pensions and wages, disasters, explosions, terrorist attacks and other misfortunes, and all this, against the backdrop of eating, drinking, shamelessly she can swear in Russian pop, the blame for everything, of course, is the inept Russian leadership and the incorrectly chosen course for market reforms, which as a result led Russia to gangster capitalism. Comparing this video with the way the Belarus and television shows their own country, of course, the majority was convinced of the correctness of the course chosen by Lukashenko, because Belarus seems to be a reserve of cloudless peace and relative satiety, even if something is not going well in a particular family of a particular person, this does not mean that everyone is bad, the rest, judging by the picture, is very good, and this means that he himself will soon get better, as long as there is no war, my mother of blessed memory once had one thing on her mind, so that there would be no war says Valerie Krugovoy, it's a nightmare, 60 years after the war, only think about it, but, unfortunately, we will not get away from it, these people thought they did, my mother needed to be washed like that 276 so that she would say that Lukashenko is a scoundrel, and if they didn't do this to me personally, she would say, yes, a small pension, yes, not everything is fine, but it's clear that a person wants and tries so that we don't have a war. The all-encompassing dream and the main daily aspiration of the historically suffering people are expressed in the slogan Sai, if only there was no war, and the fact that there is war everywhere, and it is quiet in Belarus 277 is put in the main merit of our hero, quiet, and even if not very satisfying, but not so hungry as to change something because of this, and at the same time, no one even knows that it was precisely such a policy, taking away any creative initiative from the people, that led the USSR to complete economic stagnation and, in the end, to collapse 278. But in order for such a life to be accepted as an ideal and appreciated, if not by everyone, then at least by the majority, people must be convinced that it could not be better, and all, of course, thanks to the ruler, without whose wisdom, and without whose faith, such success would not have been possible.
Chapter 2, Icon and Portrait I need to be considered in refraction A friend of mine told me that after the 1996 referendum, his elderly aunt, who lives in the district center, moved the icon with the face of the great martyr Barbara in the red corner and hung a portrait of Alexander Lukashenko next to it, and for several years in a row she prayed earnestly, believing that the heavenly intercessor and the earthly intercessor would prolong her life and not allow her and her loved ones to die of hunger, creating a system in which he could, following Louis Ziv, repeat, the state is me, Alexander Lukashenko, like any dictator, is forced to deify his own personality, but here he ran into a big problem, Professor Gennady Grush voices, usually a dictator relies on some kind of ideology, Stalin, for example, could do anything, because Stalin was the personification not so much of a personality as of an ideology, by itself, they say, he is the same person as everyone else, it's just that he's closest to the great idea, and his personality embodies this idea, so everyone sacredly believed in him, but Lukashenko, in principle, cannot preach any high ideology, except for the primitive ideology of his own self-assertion against the backdrop of poverty, which his subjects consider a boon. At one seminar, I happened to hear how one of the representatives of official institutions said, Guys, Lukashenko embodies the Belarusian ideology, we do not have Lukashism as an ideology, but only a portrait of Lukashenko. Most often, a living leader proclaims himself to be the successor to the deed of the deceased leader, thereby providing, as it were, the ideological legitimacy of his regime. The same Stalin had a forerunner, Lenin, who, in order for him to serve as a symbol of the imperishability of the idea, was not buried like a person, but was placed in the mausoleum. When Lukashenko speaks about himself in the third person, he seems to be looking at himself from the outside and assessing the actions of someone else, the president, the leader, even the car, I must be considered in relation to a specific situation, to specific actions, well, what is the president, the president is a machine. I can't get rid of this definition in 10 years 279, Lukashenko had no forerunner, no, of course, he could use the name of the only communist leader of Soviet Belarus, Pyotr Mashrov, mythologized after his tragic death in a car accident, but Mashrov lived too recently, and there were those who could challenge Lukashenko's right to use his name politically, family, former associates, finally, Lukashenko says that he is not restoring the old, but is building a new one, therefore, there can be no forerunner, in the new religion, he himself is both the messiah and the forerunner, and his portraits in the red corner are not photographs of a mere mortal, one of the politicians coming and going, but an image of a person who is a symbol of goodness and justice, Stalin still covered himself with communist ideology, Lukashenko went further, simplifying everything, under it, a household, economic ideology is being created, here his logic, as always, is very simple, I know what needs to be done, I must be obeyed, in order to be obeyed, you need to turn me into an idol, you need to develop admiration for me, my portraits are needed everywhere, not so that I revel in it, but so that they believe in me, they pray for me, so that they unconditionally follow me, Lukashenko himself admits, it is necessary to bring the same student to the conclusion that if it were not for the president, he would hardly have sat at a desk at a university, if this truth is brought to our youth, then at least they will not walk down the street with orange flags 280, but with the construction of the new everything is far from simple, here Lukashenko is clearly wishful thinking, Lukashenko has all his values in the Soviet past says Leonid Sinitsin, he turns the past into a new idol, 
This is visible in everything, first of all, in how he seeks to return to our lives the norms, laws, orders of the past he idealized. It seems that he is disgusted by the time in which he lives, and on this basis, he is trying to create a new ideology for himself, but this ideology is reversed. He is stuck with the past, and slows down society so much that it fell asleep altogether, and Lukashenko is happy with this, because it is easiest to stay in power in a dormant society, if, of course, you fuel his sleepy, smoldering state at the expense of the rich, at the expense of neighboring Russia, Ruknama in Belarus and so, power is taken, the enemy is broken. But this does not mean that nothing threatens Lukashenko. We need to dig in, we need to strengthen the bastions, which, local, family, national, state, so, it is necessary to compose some kind of ideological wrapper, to justify the regime and so that the regime has a future. After all, ideology must call for something. This is a system of myths, a system of romantic views, in the end, a system of socio-philosophical categories 281, Lukashenko, after all, he is an eternal political instructor, constantly remembers this, here is what he says in his speech on the problems of ideology, let me give you one last example, no one ever, even I, know in Iraq well, thought at the beginning of the war that the Iraqis would hold out until today, for both the Americans and the so-called occupying coalition, it is still unknown how everything will end, why did this happen, Arabs, God grant them life are not warriors, these are not Chechens, remember how they fought in the Sinai Peninsula, as soon as 12 o'clock or how many hours there everyone left and prayed, and they were taken with their bare hands, and look what the state ideology has done, we are defending our land, we will not surrender to the occupiers, we will protect our Sodom, this is what the ideology of recent months has been based on, this ideological, let's face it, indoctrination is saving Iraq today 282, and commissars appeared in Belarus, employees of the so-called ideological vertical, moreover, they are called not to preach universal values, but to justify the rightness of the path and the political non-alternativeness of the person who has chosen this path, we are witnessing the ideologization of all spheres of life, from the education system to health care, even in the hospital, the local radio reminds you exactly who cares about your health and prohibits smoking and violations of the daily routine. Portraits of the president are on the tables of officials, on calendars, on the wall in every classroom, on the first page in every diary. Before there was the curly head of little Volodya Alionov, now it is the mustachioed face of an adult uncle. But this is not enough, in state and non-state universities, a course of state ideology is being urgently introduced, special information groups are created at enterprises and at regional authorities, any slightest success, natural in any normal state, is presented by political informants as a unique achievement of the regime, and all the same, it's not enough, it's bad, it's not fundamental. Lukashenko understands that no one, except him personally, is able to create the ideology he needs. Many times they tried to use our glorious army of doctors and candidates of sciences, scientific institutions and universities for these purposes. There were many proposals, even in the form of solid monographs, but they boiled down to two, relatively speaking, formulas. Let's do it like in the West or let's get back to Soviet practice, our ideological headquarters, the presidential administration also turned out to be completely untenable, meetings, assignments, teams of authors, reports, and nothing in the end, the same formalism 283, you have to take this burden on yourself. Under these conditions, the head of state had to take everything upon himself and, proceeding from life, 
and not from theory, lay the foundation of the Belarusian independent statehood with the ideas born and suffered by our people 284, indeed, where, in what book can one read everything about the Belarusian state ideology, I've thought about this a lot, the easiest way would be to publish some book, say, the president, and prescribe its study as the main source of wisdom, moreover, there is a fresh example already in the Belarusian language, and this is good. The book Ruknama by the leader of Turkmenistan has been published, which has everything, the history of Turkmens, and guidance on how to run a household, how to give birth, and so on. 285, so Lukashenko becomes both the supreme ideologist of Belarus and the main leader of the daily propaganda campaign. Here he opens a new metro station, here he is at the premiere of the film Anastasia Slutskaya, it does not matter that many perceive the tape as a pitiful movie hack, here the president makes his first trip on a bus designed by the designers of the Minsk automobile plant, here he visits the exhibition, the main exhibit of which is the largest tapestry, which depicts prominent figures of the 20th century, including Lakashan Kaji, the eyes are dazzling from a modest, hard-working, omnipresent and omniscient president, of course, unlike Turkmen Bashi, he does not teach childbirth 286 but otherwise little difference, ordinary people should know that Alexander Lukashenko was and remains the only benefactor of the Belarusians, he grants pensions and benefits, he builds bathhouses and covers roofs, without him schools and hospitals would not work, athletes would not win, trains would not run, grain would not be harvested. From every brother, every newspaper, every television news release, the people learn how lucky they are to have such a wonderful president, others are not so lucky, and the Belarusians are unspeakably lucky, deputies and ministers, doctors and teachers, tractor drivers and policemen, pensioners and children speak about it, not all bad things are connected with Hitler very often. Lukashenko first blurs about his future plans, as if inadvertently giving out an intention that he wants to realize in the near future, but in fact, these are not saying slips, but rather an intuitive search, a subconscious attempt to formulate something for oneself. Lukashenko is a man of his word in the sense that reality exists for him only in the form in which he is able to express it in words, and his deviations from the paper, from the text of the speech written by the speech writers, which are intelligible for the electorate, upon closer examination, turn out to be an attempt to model the kind of reality in which he would like to exist. It is easy to see that Lukashenko uses the same scheme over and over again, he expresses an unexpected, and sometimes completely delusional, it would seem, idea, or provokes its leakage through the press, society rushes to discuss, put forward versions, find rational justifications for a possible act of the president, in the end, the idea takes shape verbally, and society gets used to it then Lukashenko can only choose the most suitable option, and to materialize it in a normative act, a decree, a decree, a law, which further, in turn, determine the life of the country, the chain works, an obscure thought, a word, working out a clear idea, a legal document, life, so it was with the change of symbolism, so it was with the extension of office and the opportunity to run for a third term. So it was with an attempt to become Boris Yeltsin's successor at the cost of creating a union state, which will be discussed later, such life creation through the word reaches its peak in dialogue, for Lukashenko, holding a dialogue means either building a situation that is most inconvenient for the interlocutor, 
or playing along with him, if Lakashenka sincerely wants to please him, and here very often the whole ins and outs of his worldview is exposed, in this regard, the infamous interview of the president of Belarus to the correspondent of the German newspaper handles Blit is indicative, here is this extensive quote in full, as it sounded twice on the Belarusian radio, the correspondent of Handel's Blood removed these words from the printed text of the interview, fearing that he would be accused of promoting fascism. The history of Germany is, to some extent, a replica of the history of Belarus at certain stages. At one time, Germany was raised from the ruins thanks to a very tough government, and not everything was only bad in Germany and with the famous Adolf Hitler. He crossed out all the good that he did in Germany with all foreign policy and unleashed the Second World War. Well, everything else already followed from this. This is a mass death of people, including the German people. But remember his power in Germany. We were not there then, but we know this from history. After all, the German order was formed over the centuries, under Hitler. This formation reached its highest point, this is what corresponds to our understanding of the presidential republic and the role of the president in it, that is, I want to be specific so that you do not think that I am a follower of Hitler, no, I emphasize that it cannot be in any process or in any person everything is black or everything is white, there is also a positive. Hitler shaped a powerful Germany through strong presidential power, these were the 1930s, a time of great crisis in Europe, and Germany rose thanks to strong power, thanks to the fact that the whole nation was able to consolidate and unite around the leader 287, strongly, especially when you consider that the author of these words is the leader of the people, almost a third of whom died at the hands of the Nazis 288, with touching naivety, the wife of the French ambassador, Annie Joliffe, writes in her book, a terrible mistake, quickly picked up by the opposition and repeatedly emphasized by the Western press, it will forever tarnish its author 289. But there was no mistake, Lukashenko sometimes only pretends that he is a simple-minded rural guy who, due to his political inexperience, makes public mistakes, the words about Hitler are not addressed to those who will be indignant, and even more so not to those who see a reservation in them. Praise to Hitler is designed for those who will applaud the ideas expressed, for those who hope that only the strong hand of their president, leader, Führer, Deuce will ensure both order and minimal well-being. 290, Lukashenko simply took a German, specifically a German, journalist for a like-minded person and shared his innermost with him, hence the words about the German order and about the similar understanding of presidential power among the Germans and Belarusians, about the consolidation and unification of the nation around the leader, those who were supposed to hear Lukashenko did, and to the rest, who expressed bewilderment or even resolute rejection of such a position of the leader of a European state, all of this can be said that he did not say anything like that, and right there, his assistants made an attempt to disavow not the meaning of what was said, but the very fact of pronouncing the words, although they were broadcast twice on the first program of the Belarus and state radio and were preserved in audio recordings, drive belt system with such correspondences to our understanding of the presidential republic and the role of the president in it. It is not surprising that for Lukashenko, Civil society has been reduced to only those public organizations that he can control completely, work with public organizations was entrusted to his faithful colleague, former KGB Colonel Professor Ural Latipov, having tried to play the role of a liberal in the position of Minister of Foreign Affairs, in the position of head of the administration Latipov demonstrated a completely Soviet, 
or KGB, understanding of public organizations, never before has civil society experienced such pressure from the authorities as at a time when this liberal colonel was actually the second person of the Belarusian state, Latipov admitted to reporters, I am not a politician, I am an official, and public organizations turned them into state public 291. The first experience of creating such a structure was a youth association, the Belarus and Patriotic Youth Union, BPSM. It was created and headed by Savo Yanchevsky, who once set out his pants at the election headquarters of Alexander Lukashenko, and then went to test electoral technologies at the headquarters of Stanislav Shashkovich. The BPSM received state support, but with it the nickname Lukamal, which made it far from the most attractive in the eyes of young people, it was decided to cross Lukamal with the former Komsomal, eking out a miserable existence under the name of the Belarusian Youth Union. BSM resisted this association as best it could, but it was forced. The building of the Central Committee, in which I once sheltered the deputy and presidential candidate persecuted by the authorities, Lukashenko, was taken away and transferred to a new, united youth organization, and not on the rights of the owner, but only for use, so that, God forbid, they do not feel too independent. The new youth union zealously began to buy the favor of young people with discounts for their own in computer clubs and discos, a guarantee of getting a place in student dormitories or employment in summer construction teams. It can be said that the Komsomal was revived, but instead of the idea of devotion to the cause of building communism, its members had to be saturated with faith in the personal righteousness of Alex. And Lukashenko, it was decided to use the acquired experience when working with adult objects. Trade unions became such an object. I must say that the then leadership of the trade unions understood that it was necessary to find a common language with the authorities. Vladimir Goncharik, chairman of the Federation of Trade Unions of Belarus, recalls, we had to make contacts. Our first meeting took place during the visit to Minsk of the chairman of the Federation of Independent Trade Unions of Russia Mikhail Shmakov. The president received us at the residence and had a good conversation, and the aggravation began when, during one of the meetings, he said, You butt heads with the government, and I will be upstairs like a saint. I replied, Alexander Grigoryevich, it is unlikely that you will be able to be a saint, but it is desirable to be wise. Then he was silent, but as soon as we stopped agreeing with the government, all our actions were perceived by him as personal attacks against him. Back in 1995, less than a year after his election, Lukashenko demonstrated that he would not stand on ceremony with trade unions, then the drivers of the Minsk metro, who were members of the so-called free trade union, went on strike demanding higher wages, the strike was brutally suppressed, the strikers were expelled from their jobs and replaced by scab drivers from railway and tram depots, and when the leader of the Not Free Trade Union Committee of the Subway stood up for the members of the Free Trade Union, he also lost his job 292. Since then, the trade unions have not particularly rocked the boat, neither free nor unfree. Moreover, Lukashenko quickly found their weak link, contributions, at the very first attempt of the Federation of Trade Unions of Belarus to announce a nationwide action of struggle for the rights of workers, all accounting departments of state enterprises and organizations were immediately instructed to stop non-cash transfer of contributions to the accounts of trade union committees and the financial base of the trade unions was destroyed overnight, but this seemed not enough, in 2001, 
the FPB dared to nominate Goncharik as a presidential candidate, Lukashenko simply could not put up with such arrogance. After the elections, the trade union apparatus was given to understand, as long as Goncharik is in charge of the FPB, there can be no talk of a dialogue with the government, and those who yesterday supported the idea of Goncharik's nomination now unanimously saw him off for a well-deserved rest. In the end, the trade unions were forced to elect not just anyone but the deputy head of the Lukashenko administration, Leonid Kozik, as their chairman 293. Of course, such completely government-controlled trade unions have become not the most welcome guest in the International Labour Organization, but Lukashenko was not too worried. On the other hand, he achieved the obedience and readiness of the trade union leaders to support the state course, so our hero received two transmission belts of his policy, a youth organization and trade unions. Next to the pulpit the third drive belt was the Belarusian Orthodox Church. We have already noted that, building a new ideology, Lukashenko uses the old formulas, and their most incredible combinations, on the one hand, of course, there is freedom, equality, brotherhood, where brotherhood is transformed into a kind of family relationship with Lukashenko himself in the role of father, equality, into a forced leveling, although at a slightly different level than in Soviet times, but carried out according to the old principle of redistributing resources from above, Finally, freedom, very similar to the conscious necessity formulated by Engels, but understood in a very utilitarian way, a person feels free only as long as he does not come into conflict with the state system and its creator father, such a prison freedom, on the other hand, orthodoxy, autocracy, nationality, the main values here are those that are preached by the main and state-controlled orthodox denomination, the source of all blessings is the hand of the ruler autocrat, and the justification for everything is the will of a part of the people obedient to the shepherd, orthodoxy was adopted by the state immediately after a small scandal in the first months of Lukashenko's rule. Then the presidential control service began an obvious fall roll upon the orthodox business of the exarchate, or rather, its enterprise diaconia, which had benefits since the time of Vyacheslav Kabich for the supply of alcohol to Belarus and beyond. On the alcohol basis orthodox churches grew, in which priests taught Belarusians morality and preached a healthy lifestyle. At that time, I was ex officio supervising in the administration and the structures of civil society, of which, obviously, through a misunderstanding, the church was also considered a part. I remember how the phone rang, and the velvety voice of Vladika Filarate, Metropolitan of Minsk and Slutsk, Recalling our acquaintance, asked if it would not be too bold an act to invite the head of the administration, Leonid Sinitsin, to visit the exarchate and talk, so to speak, about the most pressing. Sinitsin only grunted at this invitation, General, what general, I didn't understand, your lord is a general, nothing less, knows exactly who to talk to and what to talk about. Call and say we'll be there tomorrow, the next day we were in the diocese, the pinkish stone building of which is shaped like a metropolitan cemetery. Vladika Filarate was hospitable, traditionally at ease, but with awareness of his own importance, there was a fast, therefore I had to have a snack exclusively with salmon, the quality of which was beyond praise, over a modest meal, everything was agreed upon. Sinitsin promised to intercede for the Church of God before the earthly ruler, the attack on Diakonia was thus stopped, and Lukashenko's relationship with the Orthodox Church has since become pleasant and mutual, Orthodoxy, 
which risked losing the battle for new generations of believers in Belarus to a much more active Catholicism and especially Protestant confessions perfectly adapted to the new conditions, was in great need of state support, but such support had to be paid for, and Vladika Filarate found himself embedded in a certain hierarchical system, which, as we remember, led him to the rostrum of the first all Belarusian People's Assembly, where he had to make a speech in support of the regime. Of course, Filarate was well aware of why he went to this public disgrace and, in general, to friendship with Lukashenko, more and more gilded domes of Orthodox churches ascended into the sky, more and more donations received houses of mercy, built with the blessing of Vladika, the philanthropists understood that supporting Orthodoxy in Belarus is a matter pleasing not only to God, but also to the President 294, Orthodoxy enjoyed strong financial and political support. Thus, a new version of the law on freedom of religion appeared, directly infringing on the interests of Protestantism, which, like Catholicism, historically competed with orthodoxy in this territory. Orthodoxy was recognized as the main confession of the country. It is no coincidence that the discussion turned to the teaching of the fundamentals of orthodoxy in secondary schools. This provided Alexander Lukashenko with the right on Christian holidays, standing in the Orthodox Church, to be next to the pulpit and even make small speeches from it. Although he himself does not believe in God too much, we tried to develop a national idea, nothing succeeded, and I suggested, let's get back to Christian values, I myself go to church twice, I support it. Although if I speak publicly, I confess that I am an atheist, Metropolitan Filarate asked me more than once, don't admit to atheism in public 295, but in practice, it is precisely this line of behavior, with the denial of the already existing and generally accepted God, that is characteristic of all the founders of new religions, each of them is an atheist in his soul feeling himself equal to God, as a result, today our state ideology is built on three pillars orthodoxy, autocracy and, of course, nationality says Patakrovkenko, of course, they are refracted in Belarus into special categories, but the essence remains traditional, the ideology of secular monarchy is being built, true still without the institution of inheritance, but very reminiscent of a monarchy, this is no longer just authoritarianism, this is essentially close to declaring oneself already a deity, there are only a few steps left, the world built by Alexander Lukashenko is controlled from a single center, which, of course, is himself, he assigns salaries to officials, bankers, generals and editors, he interferes in the affairs of any enterprise, including private ones, he controls everything from the rules of trading in the markets to the weather, during one of the meetings on the harvesting broadcasted all over the country, when the chairman of the Brest Regional Executive Committee Vladimir Zalomai tried to justify the delay in harvesting by bad weather conditions, the president was indignant, it's raining, raining, did you ask for rain, here's some rain for you, so the Lord God, probably, should have laid siege to a mortal who is confused in requests, and one of Zalomai's successors as the head of the Brest region, Konstantin Sumar, will soon put Lukashenko above the Almighty, which he will announce during the 2004 conference call, when he began to traditionally complain about the drought, the president told him, what are you complaining about, I'm not God, and heard in response, you are higher, serve and lick, the first assistants in matters of deification have always been writers scribblers, ready to sing of the people's idol, 
Publicist staff Jenny Budinus says, It's amazing that Lukashenko didn't need the support of writers, at least those of them who in the Soviet times groveled even before the absolute freaks in power, humiliated themselves, caved in, for the sake of momentary benefits, state awards, prestigious apartments, and the authorities most often went to meet them. The leaders of the Soviet system sincerely believed that it was still important for them to find a common language with writers, and Lukashenko immediately demonstrated that he was ready and could do without them. In fact, Lukashenko did not want to, he simply could not find a common language with writers whom he did not understand and did not know, but he immediately realized that in a dispute with the same Belarus and Popular Front, the writers were supporting not him, but the Belarus and Popular Front, they are fighting for the Belarus and language, national symbols are demanded to be returned and they are not going to give up. The frank skepticism of writers and the intelligentsia in general regarding his deeds did not go unnoticed. Skeptics, those who do not believe and do not want to believe in the true value of what has been achieved, are always a hindrance, and since most often the skeptic is an intellectual, it is natural that creative personalities immediately appeared on the list of those who should be dealt with, to understand means either turn in your direction and use it, or destroy it, or at least break, forcing to recognize their insignificance. He has a commercial approach to the intelligentsia, serve me, I will pay, he directly told famous writers, or you work for the state and for me, and then you will have magazines, there will be high fees, then you will receive for each printed sheet, as in the old days, then there will be honorary titles, property will be preserved, there will be subsidies to your art house I slick, it turned out like this, serve then yes, you won't blame yourself, but life will not seem like honey to you 296, but not everyone agreed to serve, therefore, to begin with, the building of the House of Writers, which had been owned by the Literary Fund since the time of Mashrov, was taken away from the Writers' Union, it would seem that it worked, the poet Vladimir Nyakulyev was elected the chairman of the Union, who declared his readiness to seek a compromise with the authorities and immediately received the state award from Lukashenko's hands, but for Lukashenko, the slightest compromise is a concession, and any concession means defeat. Nakulyev's attempt to find a common language with the authorities led to the fact that at some point, France from the authorities suddenly reported that a criminal case was being fabricated against him as the editor of a literary magazine. The poet, who had never been known as a nonconformist and honestly worked out all his awards, he read poetry to Brezhnev himself from the podium, was forced to emigrate with a loud scandal in the opposition press 297. The desire to break the stubborn hacks and subdue them at any cost manifested itself even in the tragic moments of the funeral of the world-famous people's writer of Belarus Vasil Baikov. After the relatives covered the coffin with the body of Baikov with a disgraced white red white flag, the authorities, headed by the Minister of Culture, as if on command, left the ceremony, probably on command. What do we do without a team, and in retaliation for disobedience, the government commission did not provide the promised buses to take war veterans to the cemetery, and the old people were forced to walk several kilometers in a funeral procession of many thousands, to the cemetery itself, Lukashenko defiantly did not attend the funeral ceremony, but there is no doubt that the idea of revenge belonged to him. Finally, since the main means of self-expression of the writer was always the word, literary and art magazines and the newspaper were taken away from the writer's union, without the consent of the founder, they were united into a holding under the Ministry of Information, and the communist orthodox deputy Sergei Kastyun, 
who had nothing to do with literature or publishing, was appointed director of the holding, neither textbook having not yet fully dealt with the writers, Lakashenko throws himself on a new embrasure and begins to revise history, one of my teachers, Yakov Ivanovich Trashkanek, wrote to me, if you want to quickly, as I planned, in five years, create something there and turn the tide, then you need to personally take control of writing textbooks 298, and Lukashenko takes this matter under his personal control, like Stalin, he is revising national history, as is known. There are many dangers for any authoritarian regime in the lessons of the historical past. At first, at his request, the school course already focused on establishing the history of Belarus as a sovereign state, was returned to the samples of textbooks and programs of the Soviet era. Moreover, those that were used before 1985, before Paris Troika, Officials who overlooked the illegal modernization of the foundations of history, expounded to school children, were ruthlessly expelled from their posts. The authors of the textbook were accused of trying to undermine the Belarus and Russian friendship with stories about the Lithuanian Moscow Wars that took place at the beginning of the 17th century, the divisions of the Commonwealth and the constant anti-Russian and anti-Bolshevik uprisings on the territory of modern Belarus. Instead of all this, a new university textbook on the history of Belarus was proposed, the creator of which, of course, was the provincial historian Yakov Trashanek, who once taught student Lukashenko. In his creation, Trashkanek tried in every possible way to comply with the official ideological course, and even the famous governor-general Mikhail Muravyov Vilensky, who left perhaps the bloodiest mark in Belarus and pre-revolutionary history, politely called not only a handman, but also a talented administrator and organizer 299, a characteristic that differs little from the one that, as we remember, his student gave Hitler, not everything bad in German history was associated with the famous Adolf Hitler, the culmination of the revision of history was the rejection of one of the most heroic pages of the Belarus and past, the president crossed out the order of Kostas Kalinovsky, the legendary fighter for the sovereignty of his region, who led the uprising of 1863-1864, from the list of state awards, this was done by a sole decision, despite the fact that the order of Kalinovsky was included in the official list of state awards of Belarus, approved by the relevant law, and the creator of the new concept of Belarus and history, the same Yakov Trashkanek, justified this by saying that, they say, Kalinovsky, was never a Belarusan, and his uprising was completely inspired by the Catholic Church and the Poles, wrote through Kuropati such a revision of history would probably remain far from harmless, but still only a whim of Lukashenko, if he did not go too far, defending his self-made system of authoritarian values, he was forced to rehabilitate Stalin's domestic politics at any cost, and Lukashenko is seeking a review of the results of the investigation into the burial of thousands and thousands of those shot in Kuropati, which testify too eloquently to what the authoritarian regime leads to. The image and example of the leader of all nations is far from being indifferent to Lukashenko, which is confirmed by the following quote, recently. Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin received me in Belinskoy, Stalin lived there for the last 19 years, I am grateful to the President of Russia that he insisted that I inspect the house where Stalin lived, the room where he died, they told where he lay, how he lay, he just lay there and was not given any help. First of all, this is Barry and those assistants who were spinning under their feet and repeating, you are the leader, 
You are the greatest, by the way, I do not like flatterers near me, they are all as long as you are healthy and in power, right there, and God forbid what happens, a pipe, where there is no honor, there is no decency 300, Lukashenko, as we see, projects himself and his own fate onto the fate of Stalin, hence the attempt to revise what has already been proven and to rehabilitate Stalin not legally, but politically, as an ideologically close figure, and now, at the behest of Lukashenko, the Republican Prosecutor's Office, a decade later, returns to the topic of kururapati, it was not possible to refute the version of the executions carried out by the NKVD officers, on the contrary, new evidence of its legitimacy was obtained, and then it was decided to destroy the memory of kururapati in a different way, in September 2001, the ashes of the dead were disturbed by bulldozers and excavators, the builders felled the forest in the clearing for the future road, which was ordered to be laid precisely through kururapati, in order to prevent the noise from rising ahead of time, this work was entrusted not to Minsk residents, but to workers specially summoned from the Mogilev region, who, unknowingly, perceived what was happening as an ordinary business trip, they heard about the tragedy of kururapati only from the journalists of Radio Liberty, they were horrified when they learned that they were forced to travel over the bones, over the graves where their grandfathers and great-grandfathers were buried, there are designers for this, they told us, and we are doing it, we are not from a good life, but because there is no work for me in Mogilev, or for him, in Bobrovsk 301, the public revolted, Kropati is a symbol of the Stalinist genocide, an image of the martyrdom and suffering of an entire generation, here, crimes were committed not only against the Belarusian people, but also against humanity, because the killer was the ideology of universal evil, destroying everyone who is not with it, but kururapati is also a symbol of national revival and resistance to totalitarianism, it was the truth about kururapati that in 1988 stirred up and awakened the Belarusian society to fight against the Ktsu regime, for independence, democracy and freedom, vandalism in kururapati is a manifestation of a consistent, destructive policy, which is based on the desire to hide the crimes of the NKVD of the Bolsheviks and the exceptional, painful hatred for everything Belarusian, for democracy, freedom, for independent and human, for the memory of innocent victims and the victorious truth 302, this phagery on the graves offended not the dead, but the living 303, young people reached out to Kururapati to save the graves from barbarism sanctioned by the supreme power, the boys fought hard, when unknown people cut off the crosses installed on the graves at night, 18 year old boys installed them again, when the bulldozers went ahead, hoping that the boys would tremble and run, they became a human chain, blocking the path of the iron, no one dared to give the order to crush them, although one of the tents was burnt, this daily confrontation lasted from September 2001 until the summer of 2002, it has become a symbol of the fact that even the toughest power can falter in the face of peaceful, non-violent resistance, and the only example of location could be enabled to retreat, the construction of the road through Kururapati was suspended, but in other cases, in the fight against ideological opponents, he did not retreat and dealt with them ruthlessly and with conviction, ideology is for the state what the immune system is for a living organism, if immunity weakens, any, even the most insignificant, infection becomes fatal, it is the same with the state, when the ideological foundation of society is destroyed, its death becomes only a matter of time, no matter how strong and formidable the state may seem from the outside 304, Lukashenko knows what he is talking about, 
children are future people like any dictator concerned about his own political future, Lukashenko thinks about children, sees in their correct upbringing the guarantee of the stability of his power, knowing full well that today's children are future people, his electorate tomorrow, Lukashenko considers the West to be the main source of ideological infection, in the near future we must show our society what they do here, how they try to make prostitutes out of our girls, what they do here, how they feed our citizens with drugs, how they spread homosexuality here, what methods they work with 305, and the conductors of all this western abomination penetrating the soul of the Belarusian people, according to Lukashenko, were children. Having thought of this, he declared that it was necessary to drastically limit the trips of Belarus and children from the Chernobyl zone to the West for recovery, so that they would not be saturated with the pernicious Western spirit. Don't you see how the children are returning from there? What does this lifestyle give us, in our country, after all, this consumerist way of life, as they rightly said in Soviet times, has overwhelmed all the youth and the country, and these kids, kids from there are already returning consumers in the square, we don't need that kind of upbringing 306. Here it is impossible not to give the floor to Professor Gennady Grushev 307 the president of the Children of Chernobyl Foundation, who is better than anyone in Belarus who is familiar with the problem. These words, with the same intonations, were announced in 1990 by Nina Ivanova, secretary for ideology of the Minsk City Party Committee. When we sent the first thousand children to Germany, it was stated in Soviet Belarus that children should not be torn away from their native soil, where will these children go next, do we need such children, but in 1990, when Mrs. Ivanova uttered these words, Lukashenko came up to me, we were both deputies, and said, listen, it is so important to send children abroad, the people want it so much, and if we send children, and not the state, the people will believe in democracy and in us as its conductors, and we started to form in 1990 the first groups of children from Shklov, so today, by limiting the departure of children for treatment, Lukashenko will have to be cut down on the living, and on his own, after all, today approximately 85% of the children we send abroad for rehabilitation come from the Gomel and Mogilev regions, these are precisely the regions that give him 90-95% of the voting elections, and they go not from large cities, but from small villages, where parents write. Give thanks to Alexander Grigoryevich for organizing all this. We are personally grateful to him. I understand what, in principle, caused the desire to limit, close, lock up our children. If there are enemies around us, as in 1941, is it possible to allow them to influence our children? Of course not. Lukashenko knows that the kids who went through the school of acquaintance with a different, civilized life will remember this lesson forever, Gennady Grushvoy continues, what is half a million children who have visited other countries, who have looked at a different life and wondered why we live this way, and not like in Europe, they don't vote today, but children grow up, there is a rotation going on all the time. The old people in the villages, especially drunkards, downtrodden, who do not live very long, are fierce supporters of Lukashenko, for them he is the realization of their unfulfilled dreams, to punish all the rich, to bring all the unjust to their knees, to share all the wealth, now, these people are dying, over the past 10 years, the years of Lukashenko's rule, more than a million have gone, Slightly less than a million new voters came, that is, the ratio has changed by 2 million, Lukashenko knows this better than anyone else, he is in a panic, 
and thinking about his own future, realizing that further this process leads to farewell to his dreams, illusions, ideals of government, trying to somehow slow it down, and he is fighting for future voters in the most monstrous way, trying to distance them from civilization and force them to live in the world that he is building. But since this concerns families whose adult members still make up Lakashan Kaz electorate, it turns out that he cuts the branch on which he sits, the only benefactor but the problem is even more difficult, there has never been a more unanimously negative attitude towards the authorities in Belarus than in the 1890s, when the people learned the truth about Chernobyl, regardless of age, social status, party affiliation, at that time practically the entire population thought about one thing, what did they do to us, where is the truth, why does the state lie all the time, what kind of power is it that threw us like that, many, even those who were in power, understood that what had happened was a disaster, the lives of hundreds of thousands of people were in mortal danger, but the social consequences turned out to be much more difficult than one might have imagined. In Belarus, a special Chernobyl society has developed, which in our conditions has turned into a consumer, passive, million-strong army of people. The state is completely infected by Chernobyl. We have two million people who are dissatisfied with everything. They do not want to do anything and only demand, give, 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 to two million Chernobyl victims add another two million pensioners and disabled people, four million is 50%, even more, of the Belarusian electorate, since 1993-1994, Belarus has been a country where the predominant electorate is state-dependent and orientated only on someone's support and help, people need to survive, they need food, some kind of health protection measures, free tools, they cannot get it on their own, the state gives it to them, and this state has turned into a benefactor in the minds of people 308 location cannot only understood this, but also uses it, hence all the obstacles in the way of receiving western aid, he does not need her, he wants to be the only benefactor. So we got the Department of Humanitarian Aid, which was the first to erect barriers, then new customs rules and rules for the delivery of humanitarian aid from each individual ministry were adopted, step by step. Lukashenko destroyed what was built not on interstate relations, but on civil ties, and this is 80% of what Belarus received in humanitarian terms. As a result, the attitude of the West towards our country is divided today. On the one hand, sympathy for people, compassion for them. On the other hand, bewilderment and even in some way fear of our power. They are even afraid to come here. They ask me, if we write a letter, won't they arrest us here? And what if we now write a protest against the president's statement that the children will not go? and then he will not let us into your country, this is not being said by residents of the Koiniki district, this is being said by residents of Hamburg, London, Seattle 309, well, Lukashen could partially manage to reduce the influence of European civilization on the process of raising children by firmly closing the doors of the house and provoking the Western public's wariness towards Belarus. Chapter 3, What's with the Facade? Own wallet even a sleeping organism has to be nourished, no ideology will work without financial support, and it is absolutely impossible to admit that today life is worse than yesterday, after all, then the people will stop believing in a miracle that has happened, all this requires funds, but the funds taken from some in the name of benefiting others, for the pump, of course, were not enough. Belarus is a poor country, the Chernobyl accident made it even poorer, it was necessary to find a source of money, 
and not from the budget, but such that would be controlled only by the president. This is how the Office of Presidential Affairs first appeared under the leadership of Ivan Titenkov who we remember from the 1994 election campaign, pulling everything under the roof of his department that, in his opinion, could bring at least some money, from real estate leased for offices to folk crafts and reserves, and then Lukashenko began to sign quiet decrees, by which the enterprises of the presidential administration were granted various benefits, for example, tax or customs, the funds saved on exemption from customs duties and taxes brought hundreds of millions of dollars to the administration of affairs, this, so to speak, business is quite akin to legalized smuggling, including in terms of profitability, appetites grew as earnings grew, business administration enterprises became exclusive exporters or exclusive importers of products declared strategic, and strategic in Belarus immediately became everything that the Department of Affairs liked, from sugar and sea fish to smoke and chicken eggs, when the budget of the administration of affairs became comparable with the budget of the entire rest of the Belarusian state, the interest of the press, and not only in this structure began to grow in proportion to the growth in the income of the UDP itself, the peak of this interest was an attempt by the Supreme Soviet of the 13th Convocation to create, as we remember, a special commission to study the activities of the administrative department. It did not end in anything good, but only hastened the death of an excessively inquisitive parliament. Worse, the deputies inadvertently legitimized all this disgrace by submitting to a referendum a question on which, it would seem, they could not lose. Do you think that government bodies should be financed only from the budget and openly? And if you remember how the counting of votes was carried out in 1996, it is not surprising that Belarusians accidentally turned out to be the only people who voted for state administration bodies to be financed not only from the budget and secretly, the amount of funds deposited in the presidential special fund has never been officially announced, sometimes data slips through. For example, when Sberbank gave the wrong information to the statistical authorities, some absolutely incredible amounts appeared in the draft budget, but they disappeared a day later, only by some signs it is possible to judge what is happening there, it is officially stated that such a fund exists, no one denies it, what's in it, no one knows 310. How this fund is replenished, we can only guess from indirect evidence, and on occasional scandals, let us recall how banker Tamara Vinikova describes one of the possible channels for financing the election campaign of Alexander Lukashenko in 1994, one of the commercial firms had an account in a bank I managed, she did not use loans, and therefore her turnover was not subject to banking control. However, this company shipped a huge amount of products, and the money did not go to the accounts. The bank spent huge resources on the technical processing of documents, but did not receive anything from this. Immediately after the appointment of Ivan Titenkov as the presidential affairs manager, both the founders and the director were replaced in the company. It seems that the scheme worked out in that company was in demand even after Lukashenko's victory. Times change. Conditions change, but people close to finance know that new conditions give rise to many new schemes for obtaining money, for the successful operation of which you need very little, awareness and a reliable roof, both that and another provides the uncontrolled power, for this you will answer the only type of business, and the most profitable and large scale, 
which, since 1996, business managers did not dare to encroach, was the arms trade, but it was supervised by State Secretary of the Security Council Victor Scheiman, whose influence on Alexander Lukashenko no one doubted. Alexander Lukashenko always knew how profitable it is to trade in arms, especially if you sell it to the so-called problem countries. It is no coincidence that he suddenly spoke during the election campaign in 1994 that, they say, the government of Vyacheslav Kabich illegally sells weapons to war in Yugoslavia. This was said in a comment to journalist Tatyana Twitter and received a wide response, so wide that then Minister of Defense Pavel Kozlovsky 311 was forced to make excuses. There were no such deliveries of weapons. This was again one of Lukashenko's tricks to create the appearance of a fact out of nothing to present it as compromising evidence, if at that time we violated international treaties and our own legislation, I would have been in prison for so long that today I would be released from prison, but the future president liked the topic of the arms trade so much that he stubbornly returned to it, Pavel Kozlovsky recalls, this phrase was heard by Lukashenko at the Supreme Council, when I was still a minister, I was sitting in the Oval Hall at the session when he said, you will still be responsible for the arms trade, he named Yugoslavia and pointed his finger at me, I accidentally raised my finger and showed it, you must have gone crazy 312, but as soon as Alexander Lukashenko came to power, all responsibility was immediately forgotten and the first thing that Belarus sold during his leadership was the S-300 anti-missile system, Cabbage, by the way, as befits a cautious person, did not sell this weapon, which at that time was one of the latest Russian technological developments, Pavel Kozlovsky says, we received such an offer from a Canadian company, to sell the S-300 complex to the Americans, he was with us training, he was in the air defense school, but he was combative, and Cabbage says to me, maybe worth selling, it would be good income, you can get up to hundreds of millions of dollars for it, that number was floating around somewhere, I said I would give an answer, I gathered the Collegium of the Ministry of Defense, we studied this problem and recognized that the sale of the S-300 system for the Belarusian army is detrimental, this is undermining combat readiness, and in that system there were secrets that, in general, cannot be sold, we gave such an official answer to the government, and we still didn't sell this system, that is, the cabbage government did not sell and the government formed by Lukashenko sold it, even during the pre-election campaign, the future president suddenly began to throw thunder and lightning at a certain Vladimir Pavtov, the semi-mythical Mr. Pavtov appeared in some terrible stories with weapons, either he sold them to the wrong person, or to the right person, but too cheaply, when Lukashenko came to power, Pavtov fled to Austria for a while, he was afraid that he might be punished for selling weapons, then he returned at the invitation of Scheiman 313 and immediately after his return, in September 1994, a scandal erupted around the notorious S-300 complex, which allegedly belonged to Russia, but for some reason it was we who sold it, and what was especially outrageous to the Russians was suspiciously cheap, this was reported by the newspaper Izvestia, in Minsk, they officially announced that they had sold the S-300 TMU complex to an American company for $6 million, the real price of this system fluctuates around $60 million, 
you have to be very naive people not to understand. The difference between the true price and the named one is too great to be, as businessmen say, lost profits. Rather, we can talk about unofficial payment for bureaucratic services, which made it possible to treat the military interests of the neighboring fraternal country so lightly and disdainfully, or rather, about bribes. $54 million to bribe top officials, if such an assumption is confirmed, is a very substantial amount, but it is she who, oddly enough, explains why someone in the administration of the Belarusian president managed to persuade the head of his own republic to give the green light to the deal he had previously condemned and banned 314. It is clear that such an unprofitable deal should have caused a storm of indignation among the Russian leadership. The deal was concluded through Paftov's Baltic Export Company, and Viktor Shyman, State Secretary of the Security Council, was responsible for supervising it ex officio. It was so important that Shyman personally called me and asked me to accept the head of Baltic Export, and, of course, to the extent possible, to help resolve one issue, it was then that quite real, made of flesh and blood, endowed with memorable huge ears and no less expressive nose, Mr. Paftev ended up in my office, its appearance was due to the fact that it was at this moment that information about such a major deal became public, it was necessary to immediately disavow everything, noisily, with the involvement of the press, about Paftev's former scenes none of the new government, it turns out, of course, both Vladimir Paftev and Viktor Shyman were not worried about the opinion of the Belarusian public, they were disturbed by the thunder that suddenly began to be heard from the offices of the Russian authorities, first deputy prime minister of Russia Oleg Soskovets rumbled, he sent an official letter to Minsk to find out how true the publications in his vast year were. In an interview with the Belarusian newspaper Zvyazda, quoted by Zvastia, Alexander Lukashenko immediately stated, This is a secret complex made by Russia with the participation of Belarus, I cannot sell it. If we want to trade intelligently, then such steps need to be decided jointly 315. But the deal went through, and the words of the Belarusian president could only be understood as an invitation to the Russian side to joint actions of this kind. Mix instead of potatoes apparently, Russia accepted this invitation. Lukashenko began to sell the latest MiG-29, MiG-27 and so on, the newest in the Belarusian army, which were in service, previously. We simply did not sell these aircraft, they sold the old ones, which were removed from service, but it is impossible to make such serious transactions as the multi-million dollar deal with Peru, and others, without Russia, with any deal on serious equipment, there is a very serious pre-sale preparation, a lot of money is invested in it camouflage equipment, spare parts are changing, each type of equipment is installed almost at full resource, but there was no such opportunity in Belarus 316, well, let's say that in the Belarusian army they were considered the newest, but, in the end, they pumped the Peruvian president Fujimori with the most junk, these MiGs were delivered from Russia to Belarus back in my time, they were old 317, such transactions were carried out by Belarus together with Ukraine and Russia, and everyone benefited 318, moreover, it is so profitable that today it is already possible to say with a certain degree of certainty, all the then rumbling of Oleg Soskovets was nothing more than a tribute to the public opinion of Russia 319. 
therefore, as evidenced by a letter from Defense Minister Anatoly Kosenko addressed to Lukashenko regarding the sale of the same infamous S-300 complex, the preparation of this contract was carried out on the basis of opinions of the first vice premier of the Russian Federation Soskovitso, a letter of the Baltic Export Enterprise dated September 14, 1994, response of the management of the state corporation Rosvrus Hini dated 20.10.1994, Claim No. 80,130,211, in which the initiative of the Baltic Export Enterprise on the joint export of weapons, including the S-300 PMU, was supported. Letter from KB Kontsevo, dated 02.11.94, Ref. No. 105509, about the possibility of exporting the S-300 PMU air defense system without removing the secret stamp. Here it is necessary to correct the Isvestia newspaper, according to our data, for the part of the S-300 that was at the disposal of Belarus and, being new, cost 1.2 million, the buyer paid exactly 7.7 .7 million. That is, they sold with a clear gain. It remains only to add that the U.S. Department of Defense was the true buyer, and Russian, Ukrainian and Kazakh structures took part in the supply of elements for the pre-sale preparation of the installation, in a word, cooperation beneficial to all interested parties, including, presumably, the United States, but in addition to the official profit, which, whatever one may say, belongs to the state, in such cases there is also a kickback, that is, money received by individuals who organize such a deal, this is not about spirits or cognac, which are now considered a bribe in Belarus and serve as a pretext for dismissing the head physician of a hospital or a school director. The order of numbers here is completely different, and here is the evidence. In addition to the Belarus and mix delivered in Peru, the new director of Rosvrus Hini Yevgeny Ananyev sold several more already directly on behalf of Russia. The size of the kickback to Ananyev reached 18 million, and Belarus sold an entire squadron to Fujimori. The question is, what kind of rollback should we talk about in this case? It must be said that Lukashenko quickly got into the taste of the arms trade and even decided to undermine the monopoly of Vladimir Pavtov. For this purpose, the Bauspatsvnstechnik enterprise was created, which began, by passing Pavtov and his company, to conclude contracts with fairly serious buyers. Specialized repair plants of the Ministry of Defense of the Republic of Belarus also worked in this direction. In order not to be unfounded, I will list the data I took from the memorandum to the Minister of Defense for 1996. So, according to the contract 3B95 of 02.08.95, BGVTP Bauspatsvnstech Nike supplied Algeria with 12 PG-1M gun panoramas for artillery systems, under contract 4B95 dated 02.08.95, 20,000 SADM and guided aircraft missiles, Sudan bought from the same enterprise under contract 1B95 dated 10.11.95-6 Su-25 aircraft, 6 Mi-24 V helicopters, 4 Mi-26 helicopters, 100 T-55 M tanks, 2 P-37 radar systems, 50,000 AKM 7.62 mm, 500 DSHK 12.7 mm, 5,000 rounds of PG-7 and 5,000 RPT-7, by a later contract, to be 96 dated 02.14.96, the same Bauspatsvnstech Nike delivered 209 M114 Atkins to Sudan, 
traded not only with Sudan, under contract 112-616-96-028 dated 11-14-96, 500 PG-7S and 50 RPG-7S were delivered to Zaire, there was a brisk trade with Iran. So, under the contract 140RZ024 V2885 dated 18.03.96, 39P135M Atkin launches were delivered, under contract 140021-2885 dated 08.2895. Tehran buyers were to receive 60 72 V46 6 engines, 7 to a 46 2 guns, 12 T72 gearboxes, 6 gearboxes, and 6 T72 guitars. However, the last contract can be considered broken. He was detained by Russian customs officers in the port of Novorossiysk and returned back. No one knows the further fate of this cargo, it is possible that he reached the customers, so Belarus entered the top 10 world leaders not in the sale of its traditional potatoes, but in arms exports. In fairness, we note that not only the latest Russian weapons were sold, but also their own, inherited from the USSR. What a potato, it was possible not to produce anything at all. The country's annual budget could well be provided by two or three major deals for the sale of aircraft, say, to Peru all the same, since the Peruvians were willing to pay even for such junk that fell on the heads of spectators literally at military parades. Russia really used Belarus as an intermediary in the sale of weapons to the so-called problem states, for example. The resolutions of Russian Deputy Prime Minister Oleg Soskovets on Paftev's letters are known. It is known that one of the projects was the joint supply of special equipment from Belarus to pay off debts for energy carriers, raw materials, engineering products, etc., as well as to pay off the debts of Russian companies to Polish companies and enterprises. T-72, MiG. Minus 29, Idle 1, Idle 1M, Smirk, BM 21, Tokka U, as well as property and ammunition worth about 100 million. We do not know whether this operation was carried out or not, but we have no doubt that such a large deal could have been agreed with the United States, of which Poland continues to be an ally. Strong intelligence, British, American, allows you to track almost any contracts, says Pavel Kozlovsky, but everyone has the principle of trade, the same is true of the Americans, and the British, and in Russia, and in all countries that trade in weapons, including Belarus, when weapons are sold through third countries, I don't think those who sold sold directly, that's how America trades. This gives Lukashenko a clue to accuse the U.S. of using double standards. Why is it that Belarus can supply weapons to Poland, but not to Iran and Sudan? How it's done? Tamara Vinikova told me about how technically such transactions are carried out. 320. The Republic had the right to buy and sell weapons, but at the same time comply with international legal norms. To carry out these operations by state military structures, accounts must be opened with the National Bank. The maintenance of such accounts is carried out by a bank employee who has a special permit, special officer, as they are called in the banking environment. These operations have a special registration procedure, special CFS, the special officer does not have the right to independently even check the contract itself, intervene during the operation, with the exception of purely technical aspects of the payment. When such operations began to be carried out by commercial firms, banks had difficulties. The National Bank has not prepared a legislative framework for this. After the merger with Sberbank, an account of one of the commercial firms was opened in Belarus Bank. 
assistance in opening accounts was provided by employees of the Security Council. Very quickly, money began to flow into the accounts, but then difficulties arose with their use. After the merger of the banks, all management was carried out by the personnel of Belarus Bank, and they used the system of conducting and controlling operations introduced by Western World Banks. We had a system of stepwise risk reduction and control. For example, I did not have the right to order the execution of an operation to anyone except the deputy, and he could only order the head of the department, the last head of the department, and only that one, directly to the performer. The performer had no right to execute anyone's command, except for his head of department, as he would have been fired instantly. This scheme was monitored hourly by special control services. When the first payments for the products sold were received, the company brought payment documents on the same day to transfer money from the bank. However, the technical executor refused to carry out transactions, since the Western payer and the bank of this payer made mistakes in the payment codes and ciphers when transferring money. In accordance with legislative norms, the bank that accepted the payment is obliged to make a clarifying request or return the money to the payer. Until the settlement of all the technical aspects of the payment, the money is transferred to the so-called intermediate account, or account of unexplained payments, as it is called in banks, but an employee of the security council came to me and demanded an immediate transfer of money, in addition, recommended to minimize the number of employees in contact with payments, which automatically crossed out the entire Western scheme of command and control. My explanations about the impossibility of making a payment were not understood not only by him, but also by the top leadership of the Security Council and the country. In their opinion, it was sabotage on my part. It was after this that my relationship with Shimon deteriorated sharply, soon followed her transfer, as we remember, swift and unexpected for Vinikova herself, to the post of head of the National Bank. She was replaced at Belarus Bank by Nadezda Yermakova, a good friend of Lukashenko since her days in Shplov. It must be assumed that the compatriot did not disappoint him. Many Vinikovsky personnel, burdened with excessive knowledge, were forced to leave Belarus Bank, making room for more reliable Mogilev. Lukashenko has always trusted fellow countrymen more, especially in matters requiring secrecy in dealing with finances 321. When everything is so confusing and complicated, it is not difficult for even an inexperienced simpleton to imagine what kind of kickbacks and what kind of off-budget income we are talking about here. The only question is where the money received from the arms trade went, not to the budget, of course, otherwise it is not clear why all this opacity and increased secrecy are needed at all. The budget does not receive the main income from all shady deals, whether it is profit from the duty-free trade in alcohol, or kickbacks for the preferences granted, or cleanliness from arms deals, and much more. 300 grams of have for the president once, being a person not experienced in business, I asked Leonid Sinitsin, and what happens next with the money received in the presidential special fund, Sinitsin always tried to avoid such topics, this time, too, he answered reluctantly, but importantly, money works in the presidential fund, like in any bank. The business you want to start needs initial capital, let's say I want to build a factory, I need money, I get money, promote the business, then return the money with interest, that is ordinary usury, so, what's next, how are they spent, well, are there any critical situations, the same Mercedes for each chairman of the district executive committee, and we have more than a hundred of them. 
There is also an elementary envelope encouragement of the HAD 322, and to yourself personally, are you sure that at the same time he personally does not postpone anything for himself, why, well, for a rainy day, let's say, if that day comes for him, I'm afraid that he will no longer need the money, and he understands it better than you and me. When Lukashenko is spoken and written about as the richest of the rulers, there is obvious confusion. True, as soon as he begins to beat his chest with his fist and assure us how modestly he lives, the confusion only deepens. I don't have a wallet, let's say I love have a. When I see how beautiful it is, I ask you to buy me 300-400 grams, I don't have a wallet today and I don't have any money, they are simply not needed, and if you need to buy something in your country, my assistant always has my money, my salary, on account of the salary, I can buy something, this is from a... Lukashenko's interview to the Podmoskovny is vast newspaper, in fact, for all 10 years of the presidency, he personally did not acquire anything, except for the domestic comforts that rely on the position and the official signs of loyalty from his subjects, hockey ammunition, skiing, even the presidential Boeing, all this, by and large, is trinket. Fortunately for us, our country is small, not rich in resources and, moreover, European, here you will not reign like Turkmen Bashi, true, Titankov was the manager, the same assistant who provided everything, there were some high-profile trade scandals, 500 million there, 500 here. We saved some money on Russian gas, buying at one price and selling at another. Well, they traded in weapons beyond the budget 323. Personally, I have no doubt that all this money is not Lukashenko's personal money. So far, no one has disclosed either the numbers of accounts in his name or the name of any of his relatives, or the amounts in these accounts, most likely. Such accounts simply do not exist, they don't need him, there will always be a well-wisher ready to take on the role of the presidential wallet, this became known after the arrest of a prominent businessman Viktor Lokvinets, who worked under the roof of Ivan Titankov, Lokvinets, known in law enforcement under the nicknames Vitya Kokhoznik and Brigadier, went too far. That Titankov included him in the official delegation headed by Alexander Lukashenko for a trip to Turkey, since the Ministry of Internal Affairs, the KGB and the Security Council in the case of Lokvinets for a while forgot about interdepartmental competition and joint forces, Titankov decided that the highest, or rather, the most august roof would not interfere with Lokvinets. So the Kokhoznik ended up in the presidential delegation, lit up in front of television cameras and finally believed in his own invulnerability 324, but it did not help, interested in eliminating such an unfortunate interference, the silo Vicky, whom the Kokhoznik tried to squeeze out of the oil business, managed to bring to the attention of Alexander Lukashenko the scale of the personally earned by the presumptuous Kokhoznik, who, moreover, leaned out substituting Lukashenko. The go-ahead was received for arrest. Here is how Ivan Titankov describes this whole story. In fact, surrendering Lukashenko to the press, when he was arrested, I was on a business trip, they called me and informed me, and Lokvinets was and remains like a brother for me, I experienced a real shock, in the five years of my work, he brought up to a million dollars to the property of the state, moreover, it was at his expense that personal items for Lukashenko were always bought, clothes, shoes and everything else, I immediately wanted to quit, went to the president 325 he started yelling at me, then I raised this topic several more times, and he once told me, 
he is in prison instead of U-326, it is obvious that, giving the green light to the arrest, Lukashenko set himself up, by the arrest of Viti Kokhoznik, he was, in fact, forced to admit that corruption flourishes in his environment and almost with his knowledge, that even the president's personal belongings are bought not with his money, and not even with state money, but with the funds of some Lokvinets. In the end, Lokvinets had to be released. Titankov managed to back him and himself for mercy. Of course, they were released, although Lukashenko previously nationalized the funds earned by Kokhoznik 327. So the trainer sometimes shakes out nuts from the cheek pouches of the monkey, which the poor fellow did not have time to swallow, just like that, for prevention, to know who's boss in the house, but Lukashenko really doesn't need money, not because costumes are bought for him with the money of new and new lock vinians, it's just that money is not an end in itself for him, for him, the main thing is power which gives everything, why does he need everything else, why does he need money, comfort, fame, he can get it at any moment, perhaps he likes to count his personal money, if any, but I think that everything in his system is not started for the sake of money 328, indeed, Lukashenko differs from any Russian oligarch in that he manages not just huge sums, but all state property, why feel your pocket here? Firstly, there is no point, the money, say, received as a result of the sale of a squadron of aircraft in Peru, cannot be hidden, at the very least, we are talking about 300 million dollars, secondly, the whole country is your household, and a good owner, which Lukashenko considers himself to be, does not steal from himself, he just uncontrollably distributes the proceeds. It can be said that the main official of Belarus, which is the president by position, behaves exactly like the director of an investment fund, among the shareholders of which there is no consolidated majority. He calmly disposes of their property as his own, determining to whom and how much dividends should be paid. In the same way, Lukashenko, withdrawing money from the budget to his funds, then uses them to feed the electorate loyal to him by social categories or in the regions that support him, for example, in the Chernobyl zone. Here I fully agree with the film director Yuri Kashchevatsky. Lukashenko is absolutely convinced that when he does not show money in the budget, this is not theft. Imagine how he talks. Here sits the parliament, which should distribute the budget, but how can these idiots distribute correctly when only I can distribute correctly, I alone know where to throw this money, therefore, when I sell mix in Peru, I will not show this money in the budget, but not because I want to put this money in my pocket, but in order to properly distribute it, it's not called stealing, as any lawyer will attest. This is just a political abuse of power, but why then power, if not to abuse it? The holy faith in his own rightness and his own exclusivity leads to the fact that Lukashenko, defending his boundless power, believes that he is actually protecting the interests of the entire people, even when he leaves his house. Former ambassador to Japan Pyotr Takrovkenko recalls how Alexander Lukashenko's hasty visit to the Winter Olympics in Nagano was paid for. The time of departure is suitable, the 11th or 12th day, before departure, you must pay for the rooms. I approached Titankov, Titankov brought with him half a busload of fat, souvenirs, vodka, in the full sense of the word. His whole room was filled with all sorts of food and gifts. True, Lukashenko then flew to the Far East, made two more landings somewhere, so all this food was intended not only for Japan 329. I go to Titankov, 
Ivan Ivanovich, we have to pay for the hotel. Titankov approaches the porter, the porter holds out the bills. Ivan Ivanovich casually clicks the lock of the suitcase and literally pours out about a hundred thousand dollars, and he starts to poke them in packs of ten thousand to the porter. The poor Japanese eyes became round like saucers. He looks at Ivan Ivanovich like a rabbit at a boa constrictor, and does not understand anything. Nowhere in civilized countries is this done. They pay by cards or pay bills by transfer. By the way, this allows you to control the spending of taxpayers' funds, and here a person is counting cash, and even for the president, is it clear why, so that there are no receipts, so that all this goes the same way as all other scenes of the same kind 330, but this trip cost the country several million dollars, one flight, aircraft parking is hundreds of thousands. Hotel for pilots, arrival and stay of the delegation, in which at least 30 people, with him were Latipov, Konoplev, Zamatilin, Titankov, Lakashenko's son Victor, a whole group of journalists, six guards, a total of 30 people, and I emphasize, Lakashenko did not have any negotiations in Japan as the president of the country during that visit. How are you supposed to take it all? Maybe as a kind of form of moral compensation for the spent forces. Well, Lukashenko wants have a, so why refuse a person such a small amount?